I'm Caroline Davey, Professor of Design, Innovation and Society at the University of Salford. I'm also Director of the Design Against Crime Solution Centre, together with my colleague, Andrew Wooten. I'm very pleased to welcome you once again to our conference, Designing Security Futures, Framing Security Through Human-Centred Innovation. As you know, this is the final event of our EU-funded project, Cutting Crime Impact, CCI in short. For those of you here with us in Brussels, there will be presentations and question and answer sessions up until 15.15. 15. After that, there will be more time to network and visit the exhibition stands for other EU projects exhibiting here, as well as talk with members of the CCI consortium. And the conference will close at 15.45. For those of you joining online, once again, welcome back. You can listen to the presentations and question and answers. The online conference will close for you at 15.15. And there will, of course, be a pause in transmission over lunch and coffee breaks. For those of you joining for the first time today, and as a reminder to everyone else, a few points of general housekeeping. There is a guarded cloakroom so that you can safely and conveniently leave your coats and bags. The cloakroom is on the ground floor. The toilets are downstairs and can be accessed through the foyer. And there are also downstairs some rooms that we'll be using for the LEA tool presentations. If you'd like to have a look in your pack, um, you will see that there are brochures for each of the LEA tools in there. To ensure your health and well-being for all of those here in Brussels and to comply with the COVID rules recently implemented in Brussels, can I also remind you, masks are mandatory at all times within the conference venue, except when eating or drinking, and do please make use of the disinfectant materials available around the venue. And that goes particularly for speakers when you're coming up onto the stage please make sure that before and afterwards you use the disinfectant. So moving on, it's with great pleasure that I introduce our keynote speaker today, Johannes de Haan. Johannes is Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice Officer at the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. He supports the work of the United Nations Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice is involved in identifying and promoting promising practices in the field of crime prevention and has a particular focus on community-based crime prevention. Prevention and collaboration are central tenets of CCI and I'm very much looking forward to his presentation. So over to you, Johannes, if you'd like to come up on stage. He's going to be telling us about practitioner and end user engagement in addressing policing and security issues. Thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, thank you very much, CCI team, uh, for having me here today to give a presentation at the start of day two. Um, as uh, Caroline already mentioned, I work at the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime uh, that you might be familiar with. We were part of the UN Secretariat. Um, our headquarters is not in New York, but in Vienna. Um, and we have field offices around the world that, uh, uh, that support member states. Um, so as, as part of the UN uh, ODC, uh, I will give you a bit of a flavor of what we're doing, but also you know, dive in, in like Caroline said, what, what, what do we see in terms of promising practices in the countries that we work. So as you and ODC, just to give you a bit of a context, we, we promote the implementation of, of crime and, and drugs-related conventions and a wide range of, of standards and norms in crime prevention and criminal justice. I think the first one, the conventions are maybe better known. We have the Convention on Organized Crime uh, and its protocols uh, on, on, on terrorism, uh, corruption, uh, drugs. But the standards and norms are, are let's say, um, uh, uh, um, 
it's an interesting set of, of standards that are not legally binding, but give guidance to member states on how to improve their, their criminal justice systems, but also to work better on crime prevention. So these standards include, for example, guidance documents on policing, uh, such as the code of conduct uh, for law enforcement officials or, or the principles on, on the use of force, as well as the crime prevention guidelines that, that call for the involvement of, of a wide range of government actors and local communities um, in efforts to reduce and prevent crime. So the importance of, of end user engagement in policing really features prominently in these guidelines that call for evidence-based policies and, and strategies that um, ensure the right crime and safety problems are being tackled, something that we really discussed in depth last uh, yesterday as well. So it's clear that this requires a really a bottom-up approach to gain a deep understanding of problems and get towards improved implementation of, of solutions. It also requires qualitative data analysis to supplement the quantitative data uh, that we're having to understand really the background and the applicability of policing interventions. So I am very happy to be able to participate in, in the CCI event yesterday and today and around the to really you know, engage in discussions around the human-centered approach to security and the achievements of the, of the projects as such. Um, just to give you a bit of context where we're coming from as UN, um, of course what we do um, is, you know, is set out by what member states agree. And uh, as you may know, the Kyoto Declaration that was adopted earlier this year at the 14th United Nations uh, Crime Congress calls on member states to advance cooperation among stakeholders and the police, promote positive conflict resolution, as well as community-oriented policing within the context of crime prevention. Now, why is this worth mentioning here? Well, I think it's important to realize that the Congress, uh, being a global event, sets out the issues that member states in all regions of the globe uh, agree are important for reducing um, and addressing crime and violence. And therefore, in the future, we really expect to see specific follow-up to the declaration in terms of police reform, crime prevention, by member states, but also by the United Nations uh, and international regional organizations. So, with this in mind, our new UNODC strategy that we recently issued for 2021-2025 contains specific outcomes on strengthening access to justice, including increased accountability of criminal justice systems to the community, as well as on more effective community and knowledge-based crime prevention. After all, I think we can all agree that in the areas of social developmental prevention, situational correctional prevention, but also drug treatment and prevention, there is just a lot of practices that work and that deserve to be promoted. Um, I would like to use the next 15 minutes or so to um, reflect on the role of law enforcement in community-based prevention and highlight some of the promising practices that, uh, that we observe in the countries we work with. Uh, not just, you know, focusing on Europe, but also on other regions. Um, in this context, I think establishing trust between police and community citizens, the end users, it's really, it's really crucial for prevention of crime and making sure that communities, citizens feel safe and secure. So citizen-centered policing will need to have community trust and confidence at its core, allowing for greater understanding of the problems and issues faced. And we believe that community-oriented policing as part of, and that's very important, as part of a human rights-based approach to policing can really be an effective tool to build such trust. It can also help to increase police legitimacy prevent crime better, strengthen community resilience, and it can allow for more effective performance of the police duties, including, for example, intelligence-led policing. So ideally, a police agency that introduces community-oriented policing has really the potential to balance more conventional reactive responses to violence and crime with proactive efforts that look um, at risk factors and to compass early intervention prevention as well as treatment where needed. So since approximately the 1990s, 
we see that community-oriented policing really has developed from a primarily local policing approach to a more generalized philosophy of policing, closely linked to pro problem-oriented policing, and the scanning analysis and responding to problems at the local level. <clears throat> so consulting and mobilizing communities are really the essential elements of community-oriented policing, but how a community is defined may really differ. And we see more or less two models emerging here that are not mutually exclusive. One, an emphasis on a very small, coherent geography where police supports the community to take care of prevention activities. And two, a model that interprets community a bit more broadly as the public and that seeks a partnership role of police and community groups and individual citizens through a problem-solving model. So I think here, what, we, what seems advisable, uh, looking at practices but also at research, is that it's probably best to really look at community as a rather fluid concept with, with individuals that are affected by a variety of different contexts and ties. Um, and it's really clear that we really need to engage a large group of different stakeholders. So building community resilience really requires innovative thinking um, about who may be able to contribute in a society, in a community, to changing behavior um, and how intervention capacities of these stakeholders, community stakeholders, can and should be strengthened. I think we can all agree that one cannot simply assume that communities will uh, and can engage in crime prevention, they also need training, uh, support, including resources. Implemented successfully, community policing can lead to more accountable police that responds better to local needs through, a, for example, routine patrols, regular consultations with citizens, community groups, school visits, mediation, etc. And needless to say, it's important that the police be able to leverage support, resources and interventions, not just from within and within the community, but also from other government services, such as the health, housing, social services, as well as the private sector, to assist in problem identification, information sharing, problem solving and responses. For example, combining policing approaches that aim to deter violent behavior among known offenders with strategies that reward compliance um, by providing positive incentives, such as access to social services, job opportunities, etc., are known to be promising. Also, police-initiated diversion programs um, uh, are a promising solution for diverting uh, children, youth, accused of committing an offense from the juvenile justice system. Such programs require close cooperation between the police on the one hand and community members and stakeholders such as the protection system and prosecutors. An example of such diverse police-led diversion is the HALT program in the Netherlands, which has shown uh, good results in this regard. As community policing, community-oriented policing, as we like to refer to it, has developed over time, more emphasis has been placed on diversity, which is a good thing. The growing recognition of the importance of the relationships between the police and minority communities. And this has come also to the fore in the discussions around the Black Lives Matter movement, for example. Another dimension of diversity is, of course, the role of women in policing, where we have noticed that the inclusion of women in the service at all levels uh, really can improve women's access to justice and help deter future crime and violence. Having said all this, I would like to highlight some of the, the research findings from recent years that, uh, that tell us a little bit about the impact of proactive policing, what we're talking about here. Interestingly, uh, a fairly recent 2019 randomized trial in the US found that even single instance of positive non-enforcement contact with the police improved public attitudes towards the police. And the strongest effect was among racial minorities and those who held the most negative views towards police. Of course, this is not re replicable in all contexts, but it does show, show the power of positive contact within communities. So this really relates to the issue of trust I started off with. Um, also, a 2014 study 
uh, zooming in on the UK, the US and Canada, shows that community policing uh, featuring community consultation, allowing for input of communities in priority settings of the police, had positive effects on citizen satisfaction, perceptions of disorder and police legitimacy, although limited effects on crime and fear of crime. But a meta-analysis that was issued only last year shows that problem-oriented policing, which as we all know is a, is and should be a key component of community-oriented policing, is associated with an overall reduction in crime and disorder of close to 34%, and benefits diffuse to areas adjacent to target locations. So that means that crime is not simply displaced. Looking at outside uh, North America, Europe, there's an interesting study from a few years back, 2015, on Central America that really shows positive results of community-oriented policing uh, in terms of lowered homicide levels, increased reporting of domestic violence, and increased confidence in policing. And uh, their community policing was really approached with uh, local precinct-based uh, models of policing supported by situational prevention and youth crime prevention initiatives. Obviously, if community-oriented policing is supposed to have an impact, it really requires continuous monitoring and adjusting with a focus on leadership, training, engagement and investment in analytical support. It requires police management to reflect community-oriented policing in the mission statement, in policies and procedures. Making sure the police is a reflection of the community is key and integrating community policing into hiring practices and training programs, as well as performance evaluations, is important. Not every police officer makes a good community police officer. I think that's something to keep in mind. Unfortunately, too often, we see piecemeal implementation and approaches to community policing, rather than it being part of a more holistic police reform effort that really aims to promote evidence-based, human rights-based policing throughout the organization in close consultations with other sectors of government. I forgot to put my next slide, which just gives you a little visual to look at while I'm speaking. <laughs> I think looking at the future really, you know, um, uh, uh, key also to the CCI project, the future of security, looking at the future, I think we can all agree that the new developments in the field of policing really you know, are closely linked to the use of technology and new technologies just appear. And this is no different for community-oriented policing. The principles of community policing, <coughs> especially the use of partnerships, really received new impetus as smartphones and social media became mainstream, allowing citizens to be engaged much more closer uh, with their local communities and with law enforcement agencies. In the same vein, we see a growing array of tools are being made available to the community, such as data portals, etc. Um, and in certain cases, tools that allow the public also to report crime online. Most digital platforms, however, are, are not public-facing and are designed to really improve police performance and dispatch, uh, Comstat, for example. Interestingly, different studies on technology used by the police found that social media and geographic information systems really were felt to be critical for community-oriented policing, but also emphasized the need for police to embed the use of such technology better into their wider strategic planning and operations, but also to train staff better and to evaluate the use of technologies. Body-worn cameras is also a, a topic of a lot of discussions recently. And a systematic review of the use of such cameras done by the Campbell Collaboration in 2020 included studies from North and South America, Australia, Asia and Europe. And it concluded that body-worn cameras did not have a consistent or significant effect on officers' use of force, arrest activities, proactive or self-initiated activities. The authors, however, suggested that the police could use body-worn cameras more effectively for coaching, training, or for evidence 
And in the context of community policing, they urge police chiefs specifically to find more and better ways to use these cameras to strengthen police-citizen relationships, internal investigation or accountability systems. I'm almost done. I don't <laughs> <laughs> Our uh, UNODC Global Homicide Report that we uh, uh, frequently issue, and you see a picture here on the screen, illustrated the importance of, of place-based interventions for prevention, something that we have been talking about yesterday a lot. Uh, and it also uh, illustrates recent advances in data processing geospatial mapping and artificial intelligence, which give rise to a host of new crime detection and forecasting tools. As you know, crime prediction platforms are increasingly common, Europe, North America, but also, for example, more and more in Latin America. And the combination of these platforms together with data-driven policing and prevention could generate significant reductions in crime and, non, uh, and violence, if data protection and civil liberties concerns were to be properly addressed in the development and use of these platforms. It is clear that research on the use of new technologies for policing should really continue in order to ensure informed decision making in this area, but also that policies and regulatory frameworks on the use of these technologies are in line with human, international human rights norms and standards, and to ensure that the public the end users are really aware of the, the scale and scope of devices and programs. As UNODC and the United Nations as a whole, we, we offer technical assistance in, in these areas that I highlighted. And we support sharing of good practices among member states and practitioners. So we're very keen to, to engage in initiatives like the CCI project. Uh, and engage with experts like yourself to really to better understand what works, what you see is promising, and what can we really do and, uh, to cut crime and help states reach the ambitious crime and violence related targets under the sustainable development agenda. So um, with that, I would like to end my presentation and thank you. And if there are any questions, please do raise your hand. So thank you very much, Johannes. That was a very, very interesting presentation. So I open it to the floor then. Has anyone got a question? Um, can I ask again that um, if you ask a question, please use the microphone um, so that we can pick up your question on the live stream. Who would like to start with a question? Somebody's got to do the job. Thank you very much. It's if you'd like to introduce history. yourself and then for your question, that'd be excellent. Uh, thank you. Jaap de Waard from the Netherlands, Ministry of Justice and Security. Johannes, thank you very much for your very clear presentation. Uh, and, uh, well, I, I noticed a lot of those references that you were talking about. And that's actually my question. Um, we have seen a wealth of, of really very good reviews over the last 10 years. And the thing, at least in my experience, is it is very difficult to, to reach the, the policy arena with those kinds of uh, results. Uh, do you have any suggestions from your work at the UNODC to more efficiently, uh, let's say, disseminate to target, targeted audiences this kind of information? Because in my opinion, the last 10 years has shown really huge progress on, on what works. So, but still, one way or the other, we don't succeed to put it into practice. So maybe you have some suggestions on that one. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think that is a very, very important point. And uh, we, we've seen all these databases coming up now, and we're very grateful to those. I mean, they are in the, United, in the European Union, uh, Canada, North America, and they are, they are they're extremely useful because what they do is to, in, like you said, they show which programs have thoroughly been evaluated, um, uh, have proven to have an, an, a res an impact or not. And, uh, uh, but also what they do, which is important, I think, for convincing policymakers to, to pick up on them and translate it into policies to show a cost-benefit analysis. I think that is something that 
is difficult to do, let's, let's just be honest about it, but it is necessary to get the political buy-in. Another, I think, important uh, um, thing is, that, and it's something that we as UN are working on, is to simply familiarize policymakers um, with the best practices that are out there, uh, do capacity building, um, and then once the state is, and this is what member states come to us for, let's say the development of a crime prevention strategy or their police reform uh, initiatives, and they develop you know, policies around that to kind of then come in and kind of introduce uh, uh, as part of capacity building, maybe prior to the design of these policies, introduce them to the best practices and say, okay, what does that mean if you now want to develop a policy? Um, and uh, what kind of, you know, where can this come in? It's not necessary that all the best practices, of course, appear in a policy or, uh, or, 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 or strategy, but the action plan that follows will then need to incorporate these kind of programs uh, that no have, have, have a result. Now, having said that, as <clears throat> maybe it's, it's less of an issue here within the EU or, or in North America, but as, as, as United Nations, we see, of course, uh, countries uh, in the global south struggling with, you know, too little evidence of programs that work in their specific context and that they can implement with the resources they have. So there, there has to be a translation from, or a tailoring from those practices that have proven to work in, you know, the UK or in Brussels to see, okay, what, what, what can now work in a country like Uganda, for example, and how can we tailor that? So that's, that's another important, I think, uh, uh, step in the process to kind of convince policymakers over there to pick up on evidence-based programming and in, incorporate them in policies and strategies. I hope that answers some of your questions. So thank you very much, Johannes. That was excellent. And um, just to say that we've got eight tools coming out of um, CCEI and we'd be very happy to share the good practice that has come out. And what we'd also like to do is to obviously monitor the um, impact and the implementation of the tools so that you've then got a better database for understanding um, the results of CCI. So we'd be very happy to do that. Um, also, in terms of um, understanding um, technologies and their role in security, we've also, through CCI, got a lot of experience on that. Um, and again, we'd be very happy to contribute. So thank you very much. Okay, so um, moving on now, then um, moving on to the um, CCI lessons and policy recommendations. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce to you Paul Van Sumeren. And he's going to give the presentation um, on this topic. And he is the founder of DSP Group, a research consultancy in Amsterdam. And he specializes in urban planning and crime prevention. And he's going to be offering his perspectives on lessons learned from CCI and what it might mean for policymakers. And just to say that um, Paul does a lot of work on European standards. Um, so I'm sure he would want to talk with um, Johannes later on as well. So over to you then, Paul. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, here. Yeah. Okay. Lessons and policy uh, recommendations. Um, that's what I'm going to tell you about. And I go a step further. Um, I also include actions. And we base it all on uh, what we call policy briefings. And there should be about 10 policy briefings at the end of this uh, project. As usual, we are a bit late, but uh, we're working on it. But I have the information uh, here. So, well, um, I remember that Andrea de Condido um, asked for policy recommendations, actually, from the DG home. And um, I hope, I fear, that he feel a bit like the man sitting on the bar of the Titanic asking for a whiskey and then said, well, I asked for ice, but this is ridiculous. So. 
I have about six icebergs for you uh, uh, today, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go through it. So, and I have even organized it a bit. Um, here you see the six. I start with the impact, um, and then I go to the cutting, and then I, I end with, uh, with, with the crime. So, about cutting crime impact, talking about the impact. Impact for whom is a question, and impact what is a question. Um, I start with the first one. Crime impact to whom? I think what is important to, to, to say is that it is all about harm done to citizens. The impact on the quality of life of citizens and the fundamental human rights. We often forget that. And we noticed during this project that in the EU they are focusing very, very much on the, what, we, what we called big and scary issues like terrorism, organized crime, cybercrime, mobile gangs, that type of uh, uh, stuff, big and scary. But what is often forgo forgotten is the almost daily load of volume crime. They even call it petty crime, which is, I think, to be honest, rather stupid expression. So don't use, never use the word petty crime again. It is about theft, assault, burglary, vandalism, sexual violence, harassment, that type of uh, stuff. It is volume crime which is having an impact on uh, a citizen. So that brings me to the first recommendation. And the first recommendation is that besides the big and scary issues, policymakers all over Europe need to address the volume crime issues also. Both are impacting on the quality of life and the fundamental human rights of uh, uh, people. So this brings me to a, a few very concrete uh, actions for policymakers. Be aware that uh, crime impact on citizens and the big and scary stuff and the volume uh, stuff. Maintain the focus on the, the citizen impact of everyday volume uh, uh, crime, regardless, and we noticed that during this, this project, regardless changing political pr priorities or short-term type of uh, changes like COVID. So if that changes, it, it, it cannot be possible that uh, all attention for volume crime is disappearing. And the last one is prevention and reduction of volume crime must be a long-term strategy. The modus operandi change, new crimes emerge, uh, keep your eye on the ball, as we say in uh, uh, in football, and the ball is called volume uh, crime. This, this, this set of recommendations, these first recommendations, these first two, are based on a lot of policy, in fact, all policy briefings we, we are working on at the moment. Community policing, feelings of insecurity, predictive policing, crime prevention through urban design and planning. And it's, it's all, all there. So. There's another one for impact, and we, we saw that uh, uh, yesterday and also today. What type of crime impact are we talking about? Well, I already mentioned a bit big and scary in the volume uh, crime stuff, but there's also feelings of insecurity. Citizens' feelings of insecurity may vary per, per person, might even be sometimes not related to victimization, but as soon as citizens define feelings as real, Therefore, feelings are real in their consequences. People don't, they are too fearful to go outside, so it becomes silent in the street, for, for example. So fear of crime, feelings of insecurity is real. The recommendation is thus that policymakers should improve understanding, considerations, and means of measuring citizens' feelings of insecurity. And that is, that is uh, done, as I will, I will show you. The actions are quite logical. Use the, the CCI tools for measuring citizen feelings of uh, security. For example, the INSIGHT uh, tool, which is uh, uh, there by, from Nieder Saxon. The unsafety model, made by uh, uh, Caroline and Andrew the, the, from uh, Salford University. And of course, from Catalonia, the Perception Matters, which is also uh, there. Ha have a look in the, in, in the break. So the references based on policy briefings we are working on is, for example, outbreaks of insecurity require 
practical research, you understand the causes and identify appropriate solutions. Uh, Frances told that uh, yesterday, and from the LKA, policymakers and security practitioners must use a range of methods to understand citizens' feelings of insecurity. And from Lisboa, community uh, policing addresses crime as well as feelings of insecurity. So, okay, I switch to the, the cutting uh, uh, part, and I have three for you, three icebergs we have to, to, to be aware of. Reaction, proaction, multi-stakeholder approach, evidence-based uh, uh, learning. Well, the first one is that there's reaction and there's proaction. There's repression and prevention. The words may, may differ, but we always say it takes two to tango. So you need both. The recommendation is just rather simple, that security policy makers should also focus on prevention. Now, the focus is often very much on reaction and responding. So invest more in prevention and take care that you balance uh, uh, the two. And the action for policymakers is, again, rather simple. Uh, they should be aware that there is nowadays, and Jaap de Waard already mentioned it, a lot of evidence showing that crime prevention has reduced, for example, burglary or other types of uh, uh, crime in Europe. And also the, uh, the value of crime prevention through urban design and planning is, has, is, is proven, you might say. Prevention works. It is less crime, it is less work for the police, it is less cost. So the references are, for example, from the Dutch uh, uh, police, Nas Dutch national police. Tackling high impact crime needs prevention, but also a reactive approach. And both approaches are in that pro hic manual, which is also there in the book of uh, uh, basics. And from Estonia, the value of crime prevention through urban design and planning approaches is, is important, has been proven. It brings me on, on um, number two on the, in, in the cutting part. Multi-stakeholder approach is important, collaborative, problem solving, you might say. I, I always say, I just said, well, it takes two to tango, but well, um, if you want a party, you need more people. You need a kind of a multi-stakeholder approach, a collaborative problem solving. And the recommendation is thus for the policymaker, you should exploit the benefits of this collaborative problem uh, uh, solving. And the concrete actions are, for example, that you should be aware that it is not only the police that are responsible for tackling crime. It is a collective, and it is said yesterday also, is a collective responsibility for several stakeholders, municipalities also, organizations, business, and in the end, of course, citizens. We have a downside to it. Often, the police or law enforcement agency fail to ensure continuity in their relations. Uh, with, with their, their citizens in, in the neighborhood. So that's why these, um, this, this uh, initiative from Lisboa, for example, is, is an important one. And the reference is, again, from the, from the Netherlands, a multi-stakeholder approach is essential for tackling high-impact uh, crime in the Netherlands. And AFUS is saying to support local and regional authorities to adopt a strategic evidence-based uh, approach. And the evidence-based approach brings me something I put in for Jaap de Waard especially, evidence-based uh, uh, learning. Think before you act and reflect after the act. Plan, do, check, act, they, uh, uh, they, they use it. And the recommendation is that security issues are wicked problems. They are often wicked problems. Policymakers need to think and to analyze and plan thoroughly for an effective and efficient uh, way of uh, acting learning by doing, learn to do better, and an evidence base helps a lot. So the actions are, again, rather, rather simple. Invest more in evaluation uh, research, ex post, post evaluations of local and national projects, and a, a knowledge from systematic reviews. So um, we, we just talked about it a few minutes ago. And local authorities across Europe should use, for example, the AFUS European Safety Audit, which was updated during this CCI uh, uh, project. The references from uh, uh, the Netherlands, um, 
Ja, op de waard made what, what we call knowledge pearls, evidence-based knowledge pearls, and they are all uh, put put on the on the website. Actually, Jaap started with that because COVID was there and he got bored he, uh, staying at home and he started to make these pearls and then we combined it and put it on the website. So coincidence helps sometimes. For all tools, learn what works, what doesn't work and what's, what's promising. It was already uh, mentioned by uh, Joop, Joop de Haan. And AVUS to support the local and regional authorities to adopt a strategic evidence-based approach. So evidence-based working is important. Which brings me to the last, the sixth iceberg we have to, 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 to take care of. Um, that's the crime part. Our police and law enforcement agencies are really in need of a practical support. In all tools, we saw that the police, the law enforcement agency, are participating. European and national efforts should be focusing on supporting the police as an end user. But police innovations are often, too often I would say, nice toys for the boys. So they are not desired nor tested on the police work uh, floor. So it is, it is focusing on technology and the recommendation is um, European security research needs to focus more on understanding, and that's what we did in this CCI project, understanding the end user and the needs, the really the needs of the police. So the actions for policymakers, too often, I think, technology is king. Predictive policing is a good example of that. We saw it in uh, Germany, in the Saxon, and we saw it in the Netherlands. Predictive policing is failing due to poor design, lack of understanding of end users' need, lack of prototyping, lack of uh, uh, testing. So also remember what Caroline and Andrew yesterday said, the, the CCI distinction to adopt a more human-centered approach, it is set a, a lot to understanding and addressing security problems. So one more, in the end, the success is simple, and CCI showed that. Focus on the end users and focus, do not focus on the specific technology as a solution in itself. Technology in itself is never a solution. The, in CCI, the technology was treated as a tool to be applied to well-defined and well-understood problems. It was a means to an end, not an end in itself. So again, there are a lot of re references made to this one in the policy briefings. CCI uh, briefing on the need of uh, security research, which will be published uh, soon. And uh, in fact, all policy briefings um, are, are, are stating this type of uh, uh, actions. So as a conclusion, let's continue the success from crime, cutting crime impact. Simply go on following the road of citizen-centered uh, processes, a human-centered design approach, as, we, as we, we, we call it, and the police as an active and a learning partner in the prevention and reduction of crime and feelings of insecurity. And, well, you as, as, as police, as law enforcement uh, agency, you showed us, yes, we, we can do it, and indeed, you, you did it in this uh, three years uh, project. And for that, I'd like to thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Paul. We've got some time for questions, so would anyone like to pose a question to Paul or to Johannes? <laughs> there must be someone who's willing to pose a question. <laughs> Not you. <yet. laughs> <laughs> Again, Jaap de Waard from the Dutch Ministry of Justice. Um, 
Well, it's, it's always difficult to, to ask specific questions after such a very good presentation, uh, Paul. Really uh, perfect, in my opinion, uh, because you, in a nutshell, I think you, you were managed to put all things together over a three-year uh, project. And I think uh, it was not only with lots of humor, but also very serious. And that's a good combination, in my opinion. And I think uh, what you just presented can really be of use of uh, DG Home in this case, because they are asking for it. But it's not only DG Home who is asking for it. And I come back again to my same, almost the same question. Uh, looking at all your uh, recommendation, but also the practical issues that you were raising, how can the CCI project, one way or the other, well, put those recommendations forward to various players in this big field of crime and, 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 and justice issues. I do not know, maybe you have some suggestions on that one. Thank you. This is what we normally do. So one guy from the Netherlands gives a presentation and then the other has a question. <laughs> and then he gives a lot of compliments. But. Well, we are Dutch, so I have to pay them later on. That's uh, that's that's normal uh, in in the Netherlands. Well, serious to your to your to your question. It, it is, by the way, the same question you started with when you uh, asked this more or less this question to the the guy from the uh, DG DG Home. I, I th first of all, I think even in Europe there are more um, there there are we we should be able to make connection to more uh, uh, directorates. So for example, the DG Regio is also an important one in this uh, aspect for, for community policing, for example. And um, also the, the, the UN, um, we, I, I, I think we did, did not yet realize enough, we, we focused very much on Europe, but we also have to think, well, there, it is like COVID, there's the rest of the world. So we have to think about that uh, uh, too and what, what we can do uh, uh, there. Um, then, um, of course, the answer is also that uh, all these projects are, are embedded and based in a, in a kind of a local context. context. And so we, we hope that they live on over, over, over there. And I, I like to remind you too, your own question, it, it would be nice to have a kind of a system, a monitoring system, or a, which is also funded, to follow this type of initiatives. Because if, if we all fail, say in, in one year, that's, that's also an important thing to, uh, to learn. So um, I'm amazed that in Europe there is no, there is no monitoring system uh, 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 for this. You have the, the, the Cordes database, but it simply puts everything well, it, it puts everything on the shelf, as you, you, you said. But there's not an active in, and intelligent type of monitoring. Uh, so that, that, that should be important. Sorry for the long uh, answer. Yeah. That's excellent. Thank you. Andrew, you'd like to ask a question. Yeah, just thank you very much, Paul, for sort of summing up the philosophy of, of what we've been going through for the past three years and where we've arrived. Um, given what you explained all seems eminently sensible, what do you think are the barriers to it actually, you know, being taken up as an approach? In one word, it's, it's implementation. So implementation is, is always extremely uh, uh, difficult. So you we, we did a lot of inventions in, in this uh, uh, project, but you see that uh, imp implementation is often the biggest uh, issue. And that's, that goes from, from simple things like, okay, there's, there's now European money, but uh, in, in, after, after the 31st of December, the European money uh, uh, stops. That's, that's, that's an example. I or a, another example is that a lot of people disappear again. So you, you have a changing and flu fluctuations in, in your personnel. I, I, was, I wasn't meaning so much the individual tools. I was meaning the tango that you were presenting, the focusing more on prevention, the, uh, so not the ah, that's, individual that's, tools, the sort of approach that you outlined in your presentation. Yeah, in that, well, 
I, I started working on prevention about 30, 30 years ago, I guess. Prevention isn't very sexy. That's, that's one of the biggest issues, I, uh, uh, I guess. If, if you're an, uh, uh, on the local level, if you're an elderman or, or a mayor or something, you, you want to show off by having a pair of scissors and opening something, something new and a new building or whatever. So um, it is, the, the small stuff, the, the maintenance is not very popular. Uh, reaction is more popular because you can shout on television, we will do serious business and we put them all in jail. That's, that's something you, well, your photos uh, are like. But prevention is, is, too, is often too, too soft. So again, and then we come back to the discussion we, we just had, had in, in the earlier question, we, we, we must invest a lot of uh, uh, efforts in showing that it pays off. So prevention pays off. So it is, it is worth doing it. And well, we, we should try to, uh, to convince the policymakers of this, this rather simple fact. We all know it here in this now, but uh, we wait for the policymakers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Has someone else got a, a question? Good morning, everyone. My name is Doreen. I work at the International Organization for Migration. It's my first day here today, so I haven't heard the discussions of yesterday. I think my question is probably already a little bit related to the previous questions that were asked. I think it's more dedicated to Johannes and less to Paul. Um, just to tell you that we also have a pro program at IOM uh, Belgium that is focusing on community policing. It's equally funded by the EU, but by DG Justice, and the approach is more to, um, to rebuild, rebuild trust between police and migrant communities. Um, so we're all also focusing on community policing initiatives, and we work together with five local police zones in Belgium. And right now, actually, we got a lot inspired by the practices of uh, CCI. We also had a study visit with Monica. Um, so thank you for all the work that you've done that can help us further in this uh, program. Um, we're now kind of in a reflection phase on what type of community initiatives to set up. And in this exercise, it's very in difficult, I think, to think of the more structural um, focus. If they, the police zones, they often suggest initiatives that are quite punctual and that is not really structurally embedded into their daily work. And I think, uh, as Johannes said, uh, community policing, it's more of a philosophy, of an attitude, of something that should be present in the daily work. So my question is also, how, how can you convince the police if they have so many challenges in their daily work, again, to focus on the more preventive work as well, and not only on the repressive work? Um, because in terms of priorities, often they think, as you said as well, Paul, uh, <laughs> it's more easy to focus maybe on uh, repression and less on prevention. And even if there's a lot of studies or even data that can um, prove that it has some impact, some positive impact also to focus on prevention, I think in the mindset, it's still very difficult to convince people that this is indeed something structurally that they should take up into their daily work. So sorry for my long question. <laughs> That's a very interesting question. Thank you very much. Who would like to respond to that? Johannes, would you like to respond to it? Sure. No, thanks for the question. It's, it's a good question. And um, the, the, a lot, sorry, there's a lot that can be said about this. But um, maybe one thing that I would like to highlight here is I think what it, of course, the impact is we need to show to police, community police officers, the impact of the work, uh, of preventive work and proactive policing work. That, that's one thing. And we need to have the senior police managers really to, uh, to, to, to buy into it. I mean, if that doesn't happen and if there are, you know, sometimes you see community police officers not making the same career path as, as others, uh, it's not considered one of the, you know, the. the, the the interesting areas of policing. I mean, you need to change that kind of mentality. But I think an important part here is also how do we evaluate 
uh, the performance of police officers and community police officers. And if you still are asking them to, you know, if you judge them on, 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 on the, the, the number of cases that have been resolved or uh, the, the number of responses to, to calls, I mean, you will not get there. So you, in the end, also need to incorporate this community-oriented proactive policing into the performance measurement frameworks. You know, have you engaged the community when you set up priorities for your area, for example? Did you have a community consultation forum? You know, do you do your routine patrols? Um, you know, how does your police office look like? You know, is it accessible? Um, um, uh, you know, how diverse is the police? So all these kind of things need to kind of feed into that, and I think then you have something to work with, and you can hold, you know, uh, the police also accountable for for making the changes. Thanks. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else that would like to add something about community policing? No? Have we got any other questions? Then perhaps I could pose a question. Uh, one of the things I'm aware of out of CCI is that we've developed a lot of different tools and uh, people will be able to look at those tools to see what problem they address, exactly what the tool looks like, and to learn about how that was demonstrated. And so from that information, they'll be able to make some sort of judgment about whether that tool is potentially of interest to their particular situation or how it might possibly be adapted. And my question to you, Johannes, is that what I'm aware of is that a lot of the studies that you talked about were these big studies that were done um, through research using a gold standard where they've actually got control groups to compare. And obviously, these sorts of tools are implemented and developed on a more local level for a specific context. And they're often much more difficult to evaluate. And my question is, is it possible for you to share such good practice if there isn't that evaluation uh, behind it. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about that. I thought I was off the hook when I left that <laughs> stage. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's a very valid point what you're making. And uh, we love golden standards and we want to you know, promote what we know has proven to, to work. Uh, but there are indeed two, two issues. Pro often programs that we know work very locally, like you said, you know, it's difficult to scale them up, um, to get the resources, to feed it into the relevant policies, to, you know, to really have a population-wide um, um, uh, impact. Um, and the other thing is that we, you know, there are many practices that may not have shown impact uh, um, uh, using the golden standard, uh, but that are still worth, you know, promoting. I mean, we should, we can, you know, it, it, it's a long process to, to rigorously evaluate impact and to do it well and uh, having one, two, three control groups. But it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, crime happens and we need to sometimes are in a situation where we you know, sometimes need to try things just to see and learn from it. I think it's important to always, you know, recognize that maybe, you know, we haven't gone through this entire evaluation process. We are, we are here, you know, implementing, let's say, an evidence-informed program. There are many examples where, you know, for example, we know, and we know life skills training you know, is, is proven, has proven to kind of have a positive impact in terms of uh, strengthening youth resilience to crime and violence, right? But you can do a lot with life skills training. You know, you can interp interpret it differently. There are so many skills, but you can have so many curricula that you kind of incorporate life skills training in. But it's not that you have, you know, the evidence on each and every of those tools, right? But so therefore you work like so with evidence informed uh, so you, you take the life skills training and you incorporate it to a new program that you you know that fits the the, the, the context or that you know meets the, that allows you know the budget that you have to implement it. So it's uh, and, but it's still important, of course, to measure to measure and to really get to get the, the focus group discussions going to really to look at do as much as you can to kind of capture data to say something meaningful about it, and maybe in, in, in the long term also to meet the golden standard of impact. But, uh, yeah. Yes, you yep. About evaluation, I, I learned over the years 
that it, it is always the same things which, which go wrong. So the, the first thing is there's often no budget for it. And I remember that the Dutch government, when they started a big program on uh, volume crime about 20, 30 years ago, they said 15% of the budget should go to evaluation. And that's a policy decision. So it was 15, it can be 10%, but there should be money for uh, evaluation. Then a second thing which, which often goes wrong is, um, and we, um, I, I work for a bureau and we are often asked, uh, uh, can you help with the evaluation? And then, then we come there and we, we ask a simple question, okay, you did a lot of work for a lot of years, but what was the, the goal of it? What was the, the uh, why did you do it? And they are not able to answer this simple uh, question. So if you don't have uh, some clear goals at the, at the beginning of a project, it is awfully difficult to evaluate what, what came out. And of course these goals change uh, all, all the time, but you, you, that's also uh, important. So goals are important. And, and budgets is uh, extremely important. If you and and then the the whole idea of well, having an archive within the ministry or within in the UN or the EU, that's also uh, important. Thank you very much, Andrew. You'd like to add something? Um, yes, just to say that um, in terms of the tools that were produced. Uh, by CCI, we took everybody through this um, uh, design process and in the area of design in, in new product development there has been many years of trying to find out why some products succeed and others fail. And rather than treat, um, I think often in, in crime especially there's this sort of medicalised approach that we're trying to develop a vaccine for crime that can be used everywhere, whereas it often isn't transferable because it's culturally based. It's based on how people operate in one area of the world compared with another. And in, in, in product development, they don't look at output evaluation. They often look at process evaluation. So they're looking at, and, and some of them, the, the, the highest indicators of success, they call success factors. And one of them is early engagement with end users, is having a, a formal managed, a well managed process of development. And those are much more strong predictors of a product's success than you know, the particular nature of the endpoint. And I think the important thing in CCI was that it was incredibly engaged with the end user officers on the ground in terms of understanding both their needs and how they operated and the culture within, the op within which they operated. And so we have tools that are very much bespoke to each force and that may not be as transferable if you don't understand the particular reasons why it is like it is. Uh, and so I think um, as well as capturing, as you said, Paul, some sort of knowledge bank of, of potential solutions, actually being able to capture the process by which these solutions came about would be valuable because then you could then more likely tailor them to fit because you'd know why precisely they are like they are uh, and, and what, what makes that successful. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank it's, you. It, it, it's all about uh, context. So I often think that uh, policy makers are very simple persons. So they see a wonderful tree and they say, oh, I want to have that, uh, they, 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 I want to have that uh, tree. So they cut it and they bring the tree home and they put it in, uh, in the earth and then they say, well, nothing is happening. It's not working. <laughs> I don't understand. So they don't realize there is a lot of context beneath uh, underground. Thank you very much, everyone. That was very interesting. Um, oh, one more question. Yes, please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mais. I'm from the European Crime Prevention Network. Um, I had also a question about the evaluation uh, with regards to predictive policing. You were saying something about that it has failed in some respects. Um, I was wondering, is uh, it rightfully so perceived as a panacea to crime prevention? Is it valid as a tool in crime prevention? And is it sufficiently evaluated? As you were saying, sometimes that is lacking. Do you want to come to that or do you want to answer that one? Yeah, can you answer? 
<laughs> Who would like to answer the question about predictive policing? Is there anyone from our consortium that would like to answer the question about predictive policing? No? Okay. I can say something about it from there. Thank you. Just to say that we, I mean, obviously I'm not coming from a policing background. There are people in the room who have more experience about the actually on the ground uh, on the ground with, with predictive policing. But from our overview that we did for CCI, the philosophy behind it is driven by often by the software and by the fact that you can turn numbers into maps. And, and that's very useful. I mean, it's not to say that it's not a useful tool, but it also is predicated on the idea that you're moving police officers around like armed forces in a, on a battlefield. You're sort of bringing troops into different areas. And in most cases, that's not how policing works. Policing is incredibly autonomous. Officers have a lot of discretion about how they patrol and how they deliver it. So actually then telling police officers they have to be in a certain place at a certain time for a certain amount of time is a very different cultural approach to policing. And I think often the designers of these tools are you know, software types who think that is how policing works and that they're all they're doing is giving them better data. But actually that process of implementing the knowledge from predictive policing into real policing, that can be where it's difficult to do and where you find, you know, it's pushed down perhaps by the upper ranks, but then when you look at what's happening on the ground, it's perhaps not being applied for all sorts of cultural reasons about how officers feel they're being disempowered from having discretion. And so I think that's the, the role of policing is not a simple movement of troops thing, you know, pushing pieces around the chessboard. It's much more complex than that. Um, so I do, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting it's a, a complete waste of time, but I think there needs to be more effort to look at how you implement it in a way that meets the requirements of the officers as well and supports them in their role uh, which is often, you know, community-based and quite qualitative. Thank you. Anka, you'd like to add something? Thank you. My name is Anke Schröder, and I come from the State Office for Criminal Investigation in Lower Saxony, and one of our tools is patrol and coming out from predictive policing. Um, one big problem in our situation for predictive policing was that the algorithm doesn't work because there was not enough data to put into the algorithm. You need a lot of crime data yeah, to analyze the spaces where you work and if there is not enough then it's not easy to use this technology uh, approach. And so we presented in a while um, but it's very necessary to work with knowledge-based data also for the police in patrolling. So this might be a problem. And also another problem is that you need different data also from the different uh, places and the surrounding and the environment. And if you are working in a place where the uh, other data are more common or, or more like um, each other, then it's, it's not possible to work with this algorithm. So. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, one thing I would like to say is that we talked a lot about what works. We do have the International Crime Victimization Survey, and that gives us a lot of information about what has worked to date, not just across Europe, but across the whole world. And that is the sort of methodology that we definitely need because we are using that to make the case for, for crime prevention. So I'm very pleased uh, to break for coffee now. Um, we will be coming back at um, 1100 hours uh, when we've got the CCI tool presentations. So thank you very much, everybody. Oh, yes. Um, just to say that those of you who've got a little red square... Thank you very much and welcome back everybody. Just before we start properly, can I just remind those that have got a red square 
underneath the shield on their badge and that you can go downstairs. So if you haven't seen Safer Communities or the GMP Community Connect, then please go downstairs and then the rest of us are staying up here. So welcome back everybody. We're now on to the CCI tool presentations. And we're starting off with the predictive policing tool, which is called Patrol. And that's going to be presented by Dr. Anke Schroeder and Maurice Illy from the State Criminal Investigation Office of Lower Saxony, or the uh, Criminal Amt in Niedersachsen. Thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are very pleased to present out our tool, Patrol. Patrol is an analysis and communication tool to support effective information, enhanced police patrolling. We are, where are you? <laughs> Maurice Illy and Anke Schröder from the State Office for Criminal Investigation of Lower Saxony at the Department of Research, Prevention and Youth. In the following 20 minutes, we would like to discuss why we have to developed an information sharing system even though we started with the goal of, predictive, of predicting crime. Everything started in 2016. The Lower Saxony Ministry of the Interior, like numerous other LIAS law enforcement agencies, wanted to improve their clearance rate by predicting crime. Based on past crimes, many software vendors promised to produce an algorithm that would predict crimes in spe specific locations. With a decree, the, the LKR should establish an algorithm for forecasting approaches and develop a dedicating technical support system with the involvement of practitioners. In 2017, we tested the tool PreMap, Predictive Mobile Anal Anal Analytics for Police. Based on the near repeat situation, on the near repeat approach, an algorithm consisting of police data, such as modus operandi, situation of the location and stolen goods, was created and custom software was developed. This was tried out in four police stations. On the basis of risk areas with a radius of 500 meters, the patrol and intervention units were supposed to plan, plan their rules. During the tests, an accompanying evaluation by the Department of Research has taken place. The usefulness of information, use of resources and patrol activities in the assessment of the effectiveness as well as the usability of the technical, like tablets, were recorded by online survey, interviews and the evaluation of GPS signals and data analysis. With different methods like observation, journaling and interviews, we explore and evaluate the use of the predictive policing system premap with an open research approach during the CCI requirement capture research. The aim was to identify the specific needs of the police officers and to capture and consider their perspectives back to the system. Throughout the research, we found out that there was no standardized procedure for the transfer of information between shifts, which can lead to a lack of information that gets rep reproduced. Some provide them with a lot of information about incidents and hotspots, and some don't. Important information from an earlier shift, it's not always communicated to the next shift or between shift managers. And also depend on the individual shift manager which information he finds useful to forward to the other shift, so there was no standardized context. Concerning using our predictive policing software PreMap, the officers do not use PreMap or any crime mapping data sources 
for the daily patrolling practice due to different factors like usability of the tablets. Their shift managers do not provide them with essential information about risk areas or current crime trends. Don't have pre-map on their personal radar, so police patrol in their district mostly based on their own knowledge. The deployment of patrol forces by shift managers to specific areas is not conducted on the basic of police crime data uh, unless, unless there is a special event like public demonstrations or football events. The tablets were not reliable functioning and not designed for patrol practice. For example, the tablet does not have its own place in the patrol car or at the uniform, so it was always lying around. The charging cable gets tangled with, up with other emergency call systems. For each use, the officers had to dial into the VLAN network again, and data reception takes a very long time. Officers doubted effectiveness of predictive policing. They prefer their own everyday knowledge. And at least the briefing structure and content differed from police department to police department and from shift manager to shift manager. So we decided to develop a new structure for situation analysis and processing shift change briefing and information transfer. With some key questions for the tool development, we started with questions like, in what way might we prepare the information for the patrolling service? Second one was, in what ways might we select necessary information for patrolling? And the third one, in what ways might we design the process of information transfer? We know that an adaption or new development must be accepted by the end users by data preparation. And we built on the everyday experience of the police officers. What we did and how we did it will present by my colleague Maurice. Thank you, Anke. Do you have to click something? It's automatically, thank you. Um, yes, from the beginning it was central that an adaptation of pre-map or a new development must be accepted by the end users. During the evaluation it became apparent that information of pre-map in operations and patrol service was not always communicated in a user-oriented manner. Also, there was no possibility to share everyday experiences from the service or to get the information needed for the service if a briefing was cancelled or missed. A testing police service was involved from the very beginning and they helped to define the structure of the new tool. As Anke already said, we had the question what we wanted to answer. It was what information the emergency and patrol service needs. Second, how this information must be prepared. And third, how the process organization must be designed in order to achieve as identical and qualitatively high level of information as possible. These findings and considerations led to the development of a new structure for situation analysis and processing, shift change briefing and information transfer. So that was the patrol, patrol tool we wanted to develop. Patrol is a new process that has been specifically designed to meet the needs of police officers and enable an intelligence enhanced approach to patrolling. Patrol enables efficient uh, communication of necessary information to the operation and patrol service at the time it is needed. In collaboration with analyst forces and shift managers, patrol was specifically developed for police officers. Patrol can be implemented by any police department as a standardized process for situation analysis and information dissemination. What are the contents of patrol? The Patrol Analysis Guide supports the analysis unit in preparing the daily situation reports. This is to highlight potential crime hotspots and development. The guide helps to analysts to compile events in different areas and give it, um, a structure. A few examples. Updated events in the area of operations from previous shifts. Violent and property crimes. 
missing persons and pending manhunts, special events in the area of operations, uh, if, uh, for example, street or drug crime, serial burglaries or, or bigger events. Uh, actually, in Zurich, we have the problem uh, we don't have enough police officers because um, they they enjoyed their free weekends when the, during the lockdown when there was no spectators in football stadiums. They uh, that was I think that was very nice for the police officers after all these uh, years. But then the COVID-19 demonstration came up, and now we have football stadiums with spectators, with supporters, and we have spontaneous COVID-19 demonstration in the city, and now we run off of police officers, and that must be very good planned. And if you don't have these informations too early, or um, so you get in struggle on a Saturday or on a Sunday afternoon, and that's something we want to do also with patrol. There are legal or political changes. Um, they can uh, um, have an effect of operations and patrols. And now the question, how get all these information from the analysis guide um, to the police officers in the operations and patrol services? For that, patrol provides a standardized process for daily face-to-face -face briefings. This ensures that all current events and developments in the area of responsibility of shift managers are effectively communicated to the patrol at the start of their shift. If the briefing could not take place face to face because of special daily situations, patrol gives another option. The daily situation can also be communicated via NIMES. NIMES that means Niedersachsen Messenger, Lower Saxony Messenger, to the smartphones. NIMES is an internal protected information platform for the police of Lower Saxony. You you have to think something about WhatsApp, but in a very safe way, so it can be used for the, for the police. For patrol, a separate channel can be created in NIMES for all patrol officers, analysts, and shift managers. Um, the analysts also can be give a structure into the information that the police officers put on uh, on NIMES that there will be um, here, um, uh, time or location structure um, if there is not a chaos in, in the NIMES. Uh, we are NIMES, all police officers receive, inform quickly and directly and can chain, exchange their information. This ensures that the operations and patrol services are always up to date and their daily routine gets into the information uh, tools. That was something that didn't really work with PreMap. That was a critique that came off. I would like to summarize, uh, patrol is not only one tool. For me, patrol is something like a toolbox. Everybody can take the tool out of the box that he can use best. Figuratively speaking, the analyst takes a wrench, the shift manager prepares the briefings with a screwdriver, and the police officers take the NIMES hammer to hit the communication nail on the head. So all information about patrol is also shown in a YouTube film there on my laptop, but I think my laptop uh, gave up. <laughs> okay, I'm going to fix it afterwards, but perhaps I shouldn't fix this because I'm really bad in technical things. Uh, I'm going to ask someone else. Um, so, there should be a film. Um, Patrol has... Do you want to have my password? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm quite open with such things. <laughs> also with telephone numbers. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, Patrol has been developed and tested with the police station of Ricklingen in Hanover. Um, the survey of stakeholders showed us a very positive feedback on design, application, and content. So we could be sure that it's really from the end users that the police officers um, want to work with something like patrol. There are two implementations took place for patrol. We had a local one in Lower Saxony with a presentation and workshop at the police department head meeting. Uh, the interest is the interest in patrol is present, um, but the hierarchical structure of the police is a challenge um, if you're looking up for a bottom-up procedure. But for police, it's a daily business with the hierarchical structures. Um, and to use these hierarchical structures, we have to take the leaders with us, and that's what we've done with this workshop, uh, present the patrol, give the ID to them, and, uh, and now we are asking um, 
uh, perhaps is it possible to do implementation applications and all this. But it needs time and that's uh, for me something uh, we had a lot already the question, what's, what's the ongoing with the CCI project, was with the products, and this is something we want to do in also after the CCI. We had on a national level a workshop at Deutsche Präventionstag. Um, we got very positive feedbacks from the participants. Um, they show interest in the application of patrol, and there was also the question, can we use this in other parts of Germany, and can we use it already, um, almost in other um, parts of Europe. Um, patrol is in German, but uh, patrol is not a rock and science. Patrol can also be used in other languages, so no fear. Yes. In summary, I would like to show again the advantages of patrol. Patrol enables improved information transfer through intelligence-enhanced briefing. Patrol enables an optimization of the information and knowledge base that supports officers on daily patrol service. Patrol enables a more effective police patrolling. And now, before I end, uh, we have some breaking news, and I give to our anchor man, anchor woman, Anke. <laughs> Yes, it is because we just get a telephone call um, at Tuesday and the shift managers from the local police started uh, to recognize that patrol is existing and they wanted to have an advice how they can use it. So we have six uh, regional uh, police departments and one police department after we informed them three years ago, now they realized it is there and they started to call, uh, to call us uh, to give advice in the next year. So this is a question and this is the way always things are going and sometimes it needs time. And so for us, it is uh, developed bottom up the patrol system, but to implement it, we have to use the hierarchical way and we have to go from the structure from the top to, to the bottom. And now it already started. So maybe good news. <laughs> Thank you very much. That really is fantastic news, because that is breaking news. I didn't know that. So I'm delighted that things, and I'm, I'm not surprised. It is so well designed, that tool. Um, that I'm not surprised that it's been, been taken up, and um, I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that. So, have we got any questions from the floor? Ah, Bram, thank you very much. <laughs> no, it's got, to, it's got to be live stream, so, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. And I noticed that there is no more uh, wording of predictive in your. So it's, uh, I think that's, um, maybe uh, you can tell us the reason about uh, why you left out this uh, predictive part. You can start. Okay. <laughs> As I mentioned before in the discussion, the predictive part is not a part of our uh, instrument anymore, and it's also not a part of um, the strategy in Lower Saxony anymore. Um, because we tried to build on, as I told you, on domestic violence. This was the part we put into the data system. And after we did a lot of very good work, <laughs> the uh, not violence, burglary. The domestic bur burglary went down in Lower Saxony, so we don't have enough data anymore for the algorithm to put it into the system and to bring news for a predictive part. But I think it doesn't matter because it's re really useful uh, to have this data, this regional GPS data, to see what happens in the region. And sometimes the police officers are going like they do it every time and every day because they know their local situation. But with this data, there are coming some news they can patrol in a better way. So I, I, in person, I don't care that there is no predictive part anymore. <laughs> 
just short. Uh, yesterday or today also, we 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 had uh, be um, proactive, reactive, and uh, for me uh, to be proactive, you just need informations, and uh, it's. <laughs> If, if you want to call it prediction, or if we have to, we say we we are good in uh, inform in we have good informations, then you come. I always say you have to come come on the normal on the eye level with the problems, with the with the challenges, and if you if you get to this level, then you can start to act. And if you are behind, you have to react. And now, for me, a patrol is a very good way to come on the eye level. And if there is a prediction, we will see. Um, if 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 you you come better with patrolling, you have more time for for doing other things. And so there could be a prediction. But for me, the most important thing with information at the right time for the right um, person who needs it, we got on the eye level with the problems, and then we are already on a quite good way. Thank you very much. Has anyone else got a question? Thank you. Uh, so, first of all, really nice work. Uh, and now a question from my side. Uh, between uh, patrol shifts of, uh, of officers, uh, what kind of information can they exchange? I take it, as you said, that uh, with tablet it's really difficult to enter information there. It's maybe uh, cumbersome for the officers. Can they have like audio notes that they can pass on to the next shifts for a particular part that they want, for instance, to, to inspect or the, they feel that something might happen there? Uh, is this uh, is the ability to do that? So just to clarify, your question is about the input of data for the predictive yes, policing. Yes, it's just, uh, it's that textual data or is also audio notes that they can uh, inform, uh, okay. officers can okay. share? So we, we have uh, different possibilities. First of all, we are using just police data. We cannot collect other data in our police system. So we give police data to police officers. And uh, we prepare this data in a special way. So we showed this template. So they can give, or the, the analysts can put in the necessary information from the day before or the week before, and then it's written in the system. Then the shift managers can give it to the patrolling officer, and they can put it on NEMIS, on the handy, on the mobile system. And if the officers doing their patrol, and they maybe they, they have to catch a person and they couldn't find it, but they remember that they saw the person somewhere else, they can uh, write it into the NEMIS channel. Like, like, it's like WhatsApp. You can give a message on it. And then you can send it to the, net, to the next shift and to the next patrolling person. And so, yeah, it's possible to be always in time. And maybe there must be a quality control. It's not allowed to write just something. <laughs> yeah, and... Um, I, I'm also on this channel to have a look at it, to evaluate it, and I never saw um, an unuseful message on it. Yeah, is this an answer to your question? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We've got time perhaps for just one more question. No? Then thank you very much to Anka and Maurice, and we'll move on to the next presentation. Okay, so we're now moving to um, our second predictive policing tool, uh, which is called ProHIC. And we've got presenting today Armando Jongehang from and Maria Krom, Marian Krom from the National Police of the Netherlands. Okay, thank you very much, Caroline, and also Anke, thank you very much for your presentation on predictive policing. Um, my name is Marion Kram, and this is Armando Jongejan. Uh, we are both from the National Police of the Netherlands, and similar to Anke, we also had the topic of predictive policing, 
And uh, as you may have guessed from also Paul's presentation, similar to uh, the Germans, we also uh, stepped away a bit from the predictive policing part. And as you can see um, in, I think it's the, oh, other, other way. <laughs> Yes, um, so we went from predictive policing to uh, preventive policing uh, and also in partnership. Um, we co-created our tool together with DSP, so that's uh, Bram and Paul. And um, I'm going to start by explaining to you what the problem was. Um, we had a requirements capture during our project, so uh, we spoke to a lot of people in, uh, well, the area of predictive policing, and in the Netherlands that's at least uh, police, local government, public prosecutor, but we also spoke to uh, people from university, we spoke to people from uh, IT business, and we talked to them about um, what do you think about predictive policing, uh, how do you think police uh, should tackle uh, high impact crime, and maybe as a short note, high impact crime, we uh, basically talk about three types of crime there. We talk about the uh, burglaries, um, we talk about um, <laughs> yeah, oh, street robbery and armed robbery. So we make the difference between those two. Um, we have the CAS system in the Netherlands, which is a quite advanced tool for predictive policing. Uh, but as Anke also said, you need a lot of data for it to uh, work very well, and especially in rural areas, uh, that might not be the case. And since, uh, well, a couple of years actually, robberies uh, and burglaries, the numbers are going down, so that makes it more difficult as well. Um, but apart from CAS, we also have a lot of other intelligence products that you can also use to get a feel uh, of your situation. And one of those is the uh, early warning system, but we also have a gebied scan, as we call it in Dutch. Um, and most important maybe is that we need to use uh, no knowledge. And uh, that's where the knowledge pearls from Jaap de Waard also uh, take place, because uh, a lot of things have been done before and uh, we should use that knowledge. And I think the most important uh, part that came out of our requirements capture was what someone from public prosecution said. Uh, and they said, you should really be looking at which stakeholder can best intervene at this point. So what's our problem? Who can intervene? Who has the best perspective for action? And that can always be a, a multiple uh, actions with different stakeholders, but it's not necessarily, and that's something Paul also mentioned this morning, it's not necessarily the task for police alone. And that's also where our tool comes in. Um, we have created uh, a tool which helps our end users, and that's uh, different people. It's from police, it's from local government, public prosecution, but it helps people to tackle these kind of problems. And we start with, uh, well, it looks maybe to some people like Sarah. It actually, uh, it's quite similar to Sarah, but we call it SAPE. Uh, we scan, so what is our problem? Which area should we be looking at? Um, we analyze, and that's where all the stakeholders come in. So in the scan, we know where is our problem, and during analyze, we can involve the citizens, uh, the companies, the NGOs maybe, everything that we need, everyone that we need, we take in our analyze, and we really analyze the problem. Then together, we make a plan, we execute the plan, and then we evaluate. And uh, our tool, uh, so it's mainly for the uh, people that I've mentioned now, but also for the students. So students are prospective end users of this tool, so it's really good that they get to learn it during their studies already. Um, but what I wanted to tell you is that uh, what we have is a book of basics. So I have brought one 
with me, and I think there's some, uh, for the people in Brussels, there's some on your tables. And it's quite a large book, but that's because it has a lot of knowledge, a lot of information, it has examples, and uh, there are two pages that I would like to uh, mention to the people in Brussels right now. That's uh, page 97, which is uh, an example of a goal tree. So Paul mentioned this morning, you need to have good goals up front to be able to evaluate. Well, that's one of the things that we have in our book, an example of how to uh, create those goals. And then there are also fill-in exercises that's on the next page. So you have an example of how to do it, and then you can fill it in yourself as well. And then there's uh, a lot of annexes as well, and annex number 21, which is on page 173, uh, has numerous possible questions to use for your evaluation. Do you need to use all of them? Of course not. But take out of this book what you need for your situation. So that's the book of basics. We also have the website which hosts the knowledge pearls of uh, Jaap de Waard. Um, but also you can download the book, both English and Dutch version, for free on the website. We also created a manual, uh, Handleiding in Dutch, which is a shorter version. So if you want to know the uh, essence of the product, it's a 12-pager, you can uh, just browse through, and if you then think this is what I need, then you can go into detail uh, in the book itself. Uh, we also have some extras like a flyer, poster, teaser, and an infographic that's in the booklet that the people in Brussels got. And I would like to show you, uh, well, the content of the book. So we have an introduction. We have five main ingredients um, that create a good solution to tackling high impact crime. And then there's the SAPE part, so scanning, analysis, plan of action, and evaluation. And the book goes into detail how to tackle these problems with both practical examples, practical knowledge, but also the theory behind it. Uh, as I mentioned, the website, uh, you can also visit the website in English, so there's a button that you can just click to go to the English version, um, and that's also where all the pearls are. And then uh, I would like to ask our kind gentleman in the back to start our teaser video. High impact crime heeft grote gevolgen voor de slachtoffers. Woninginbraak, straatroof of overval werkt ontwrichtend en wekt onveiligheidsgevoelens op. High impact crime concentreert zich vaak op specifieke locaties. Daarom kun je het probleem het beste lokaal aanpakken met politie, gemeente en het OM. Maar vergeet ook burgers en bedrijven niet. Niet alleen zijn zij vaak slachtoffer, maar zij weten lokaal wat er speelt en kunnen actief bijdragen aan oplossingen. ProHIC is een handreiking die op een praktische wijze helpt om samen, lokaal, heel precies te doen wat nodig is om high impact crime zoveel mogelijk te voorkomen. We richten ons op analyse, oorzaken van het probleem, de aanpak en de evaluatie. Dit alles gebaseerd op bestaande technieken en kennis en ondersteund met praktische voorbeelden. Zo'n probleemgerichte aanpak is bewezen effectief. In de afgelopen jaren is het aantal high impact crimes flink verminderd, maar zeker nog niet overal. We zijn dus op de goede weg, maar high impact crime blijft extra aandacht vergen. Kijk op www.prohic.nl voor meer informatie en ga direct aan de slag. Samen krijgen en houden we high impact crime klein. So the, thank you, Marianne, for the, the start of our presentation. Now I go on with uh, the demonstration and implementation of our project. Um, first of all, the voiceover you heard, it is a well-known uh, voiceover in the Netherlands because we, uh, he is on television for more than 10 years in relation with uh, crime, uh, what was happened in the, in, the, in the country. So it's also a trusted voice. Uh, and he was also uh, not too expensive, so for that reason we could use it. <laughs> It's also important. It's your money, but it's also our money. So we, we had it in mind that. 
Um, we had a demonstration with end users in the Haarlemmermeer. And if I ask you, do you know where the Haarlemmermeer is in the Netherlands? Do you know it? I'm afraid you don't know it. But you all know Schiphol Airport, Amsterdam Airport. And that's a part of the Haarlemmermeer. And they live about 154,000 uh, people in that area. We had a, a meeting with uh, the municipality, uh, with the policymaker, uh, public order and safety for the team high impact crime, uh, from the municipality and analyst public uh, order and safety, and from the police we had several uh, members, uh, one local based team uh, from the police uh, with the team high impact crime who is working together always with the local government and uh, she was responsible to communicate with the municipality. As we heard from the intelligence division, uh, some uh, people uh, who were involved in analytics and, and do the work to prepare the information we use, uh, as Marianne said, with the gebied scan and with uh, CAS also, uh, the pro, uh, predictive policing tool. So they work together. And um, I must say, uh, with a good result, uh, we were uh, happy to, uh, that we could share our information together. And we shared, for example, all kinds of data. And if I'm right, you are not able to read those screens. Is that correct? Perfect. Uh, because we are not allowed to share it. So for that reason, we made it very small, uh, low pixels. So uh, it's good that you are not able to read what is happening. But we shared all kinds of information, like Marianne told us before, the gebied scan and also the CAS information. The predictive, predictive, the predictive policing tool is the fourth slide on, on the screen. And also we shared information with the local government. And they shared their information also on the map, how they were mapping it um, in slide uh, five and six. And then we combined our information. And as Marianne told you just before, in the book there are all kinds of forms. Um, and you can print it from the digital uh, uh, version on the website. And then you can fill in those forms. And we used it also during our demonstration. And it worked very well. And we got also a kind of reactions, of course, from the, <coughs> from the partners in our uh, workshop. And um, for example, uh, they said, um, there is not a, a lot of new information, but it does provide some means to do things differently or better. And that's important, so we can learn from what we did before and make it better. That's exactly what we want to do with pro hic approach. And all kinds of other information, of course, there is also uh, given to us and all kinds of reactions. Then, of course, how do we implement uh, the, our project, our, our pro hic approach, uh, the distribution of the book, of course? Well, this is part of it. You all got a, a book in Dutch or in English as you are all able to download it by prohic.nl. Um, in English-Dutch, um, it's also published by a renowned publisher, Boom Criminology, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, we are happy with it because uh, that's a real important publisher in our country, and all um, criminology studies uh, use the books by Boom Criminology. Uh, so we are happy with it. Um, we have the knowledge pools of, of JAAP, and Paul mentioned it before, Jaap is well, very active on the internet and also with all kinds of literature. And he combines it and publishes twice or three times a week uh, a new pearl. Uh, so he's our pearl fisher, you could say. Um, and more important is that um, there are more than 1,500 people are invited every day uh, of every time uh, to, to use uh, the multidisciplinary experts from uh, uh, the public prosecutor, the municipality, the police, and so on. And um, there are at the, at the moment even more than 300 pulls. Uh, as we said before, it were 250, but there are already more than 300. And um, we are happy with that. And um, the website is used by more than 45,000 people. So that's a lot of people who are involved in our project and ask questions to the DSP group, but also to us, so that we can inform them about our uh, way of uh, creating to, to, low, to, to reduce crime in the future. We also had a local workshop. It was a lunch webinar. Uh, there were about 50 people interested from my own region. Uh, there were people involved from the intelligence division, of course. 
um, from operations, from investigations, and also police staff uh, bureau. So four different groups who are responsible for to reduce crime, so also policymakers, but also the people who are working together with the municipality and with the pro, uh, public prosecutor. And uh, for example, one of the results of this workshop is that the, the uh, public prosecutor asked us to inform them and to send some books to them because they want to, to work together with us uh, even more than before with pro hack approach. So that's, uh, that's good, but even better is that um, we were invited to a next um, workshop with them uh, to go on with this project. And that's also important for implementation. That was locally, but also nationally are we working with the University of Leiden. Um, in their study Master uh, Criminology, they use a pro hic approach. We had already a few sessions with them. Uh, they are working with uh, about uh, 30 master students, and um, we also work together with uh, the University of Applied uh, Science, and they integrate their, uh, the pro hic in their uh, course next year, uh, starting in January. And for me, it's also important that our own police organization, the Police Academy, um, use uh, and want to use, oh, no, 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 they use the tool uh, in the new study that they created at the moment. So we are happy with the results, um, and we are also happy that uh, the end users are working with it, but also future end users will work with, uh, with our project. And that's important because we, well, um, it, it, it is a combination of the people who are working already with us uh, in the organization or with our partners, but also for, for future students and, and future end users. So um, at the end, uh, the manual is also uh, digitally in the library for the students uh, of the Police Academy uh, and also in, in the, the, the hard copy you got on your table. And this is the end of our presentation. And if you have some uh, questions, uh, feel free, uh, Marianne will ask the, uh, answer it. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very much to Armando and to Marianne, and uh, we are expecting some questions, please. Ah, thank you very much. Julia. Hello, I'm Julia Hall from uh, Greater Manchester Police. It's a really interesting presentation about um, a problem-solving model. Can I ask you how you record um, your use of that model? So how your officers, your partners, um, how you intend to kind of uh, record each of the events that you're going to document? Or have I gone too far into the future? Hi, Julia. Thank you very much for your question. Um, what we've done, at least in the demonstration, is we have, uh, for each of the different um, stages of SAPE, we have uh, all sorts of forms that you can fill in. Uh, but of course, uh, as you probably know, a, a project to tackle high impact crime is quite a long duration. Uh, so recording can be uh, with those filled in forms, uh, but also in our demonstration we have not yet uh, gone through all the phases because the entire project takes too long for all the phases. So for example, we have not demonstrated evaluation yet, uh, but it is definitely one of the parts uh, in the book that you can use and um, also uh, in the book we've used existing knowledge, so also all the examples that we already have are uh, from previous pro uh, projects and products, uh, so those are definitely um, well proven uh, to, to work, uh, both in uh, what they were using in their project, as well as the methods to, uh, to attain those results. I hope this answers your question. Thank you. Andrew, have you got a question for us? Um, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Uh, a question that related to the predictive policing system, CAS, that you talked about at the beginning. Has your approach changed the way CAS is used? Because you're, you're sort of providing 
a market for CAS information in a way? And has that sort of, I know, in a, as we heard earlier from the LKA, there can be a difficulty in actually getting that information into use. And does this provide a sort of a route for it to feed into a formal um, process that where it might actually be actioned or, or used in a way that supports a lot of questions, Andrew. <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, uh, CAS uh, is still in use uh, with the Dutch police, uh, but it's also, um, you need not just the data and not just the CAS uh, maps. Uh, it's always a human in the loop, so you need always the intelligence organization to make the information richer uh, and to combine all kinds of information. And in our approach, in the ProHIC approach, it's still a part a small part of the whole approach, and it's still in use with, uh, in combination with, with the other information we use also at the, uh, the intelligence organization. Uh, it's also with the community policing officers. We, we have co uh, our, our officers from the intelligence organization work together with them. So it, it's always in combination with data, so the information from our systems, and also the information from our officers. And what we have in mind, and uh, we hope that it will uh, be possible um, in the beginning of 2022, to uh, combine information from local municipality and uh, the police organization. So we can make it richer, because we know exactly our own information, but it makes it more important to make the combination from other organizations, uh, the local um, uh, government. Uh, that's a, a quite a, a problem because of privacy, of course, uh, GDPR. <laughs> Uh, so that, that makes it difficult, but we have now some, well, we worked for more than three years with that project to, to uh, automatically uh, exchange uh, uh, or swap our information. Um, and I hope that it will be accepted by the Minister of Justice uh, in, the, in, the, in the first quarter of 2022. Is this an answer for your questions? Yes? Okay, thank you. Fantastic, thank you very much. Has anyone else got a question? Nope, then thank you very much okay. to Amando, Marion. That was excellent. Thank you very much. And so we move on then to our next presentation. Um, so we're moving themes now. Um, we're moving to crime prevention through urban design and planning. Um, and I'd like to start with our first tool, uh, which is Promise. And that's going to be presented by David Maher and Julia Hall from Greater Manchester Police in the UK. Hi everybody, wow, I'm dazzled by lights. Um, I'm Julia Hall and this is David Mayer and we work for Design for Security which is part of Greater Manchester Police. Um, oh, I've got to get used to the clicker, haven't I? Okay, so, oh, no, it's not that way. That's a deceiving arrow. Sorry. Oh, yes. This is a good start, okay. <laughs> okay, let's start again. <laughs> um, so, Design for Security, as many of you will know, DFS for short, is a team within Greater Manchester Police. We provide security and crime prevention through urban design and planning consultation and assessment of the built environment and their design proposals. These assessments result in a crime impact statement. And in Greater Manchester, the crime impact statement is a requirement for all developments seeking local authority planning approval. Design for Security is made up of built environment specialists, including planners and architects. So, what was our problem? 
<laughs> this is the bit I'm going to talk you through now. We had some tactical issues, those that affected the end users, the, uh, the people on the ground, our consultant team. The weekly team meeting is held, um, we, we talk to each other on a weekly basis, we go through our work in progress, and we do that via an Excel spreadsheet. David will come to talk about this in more detail, but what we wanted to do was have a more interesting um, way of discussing that work. We've got an ageing IT portal system, both within our own team and with GMP itself. So our IT is extremely out of date and actually about to be replaced. We've also got the issue of repetition of projects. So often a consultant can look at a project more than once, different design proposals, but for the same site. And one of the issues that we do have is that different consultants throughout the team can look at the same site for a different proposal many different times. We've got some more strategic issues within the um, design for security. Often the service is misunderstood by the police um, force itself. So we are a specialist team, experts within that organisation, but policing is slightly different from the ideas that, they, that we use on a daily basis. So our, our um, command team don't always understand the work that they do, and therefore it's not always as valued as it should be. We sometimes have a weaker relationship with our local authority planners. There are 10 planning authorities across Manchester. Some of them are very well engaged and some of them are a little less engaged with us than we'd like. We, one of the biggest problems with design for security, with urban design and for, with crime prevention through urban design and planning, is evaluation of impact and the benefit. It's not a causation, it's more of a correlation. That's a really hard thing to measure, and for us, it's a really difficult thing to convince police officers that this system, this process works. So they'd really like to see that data, that evaluation. So what was our solution? Well, we had some key ideas. And as I mentioned before, the Excel spreadsheet wasn't doing it for the team. So we'd really, <laughs> we'd really like to look at that in a more graphic basis, a mapping system. Could we look at that so that we could see densities better where the work of the team was being effectual across Manchester? That would help us with our early stage intervention to make sure that we were getting to projects and influencing that planning process at the very beginning. Could we make sure that we actually developed an integrated and detailed database because we were going to need one? Our IT system, as I mentioned, is going to change. We wanted to be better at collaborating with GMP, with Greater Manchester its Police, uh, sorry, Greater Manchester Police itself as a stakeholder. So they understood us well and they understood the value of the work that we do. We wanted to make sure that we continued to build on some of those um, local authority collaborations that we already have in place to extend them, but to develop them with others and get more work on board. So we had some core principles that we really wanted to develop in Promise, and that was to map all DFS projects and to measure the impact of what Design for Security does, the benefit of the work that we do, the value to crime prevention through urban de design and planning. As I said before, we wanted to move away from a list, from a binary way of working, to a more visual system, a mapping process, and hopefully Promise will help us to do that. So finally, from me, what were those elements that we were going to build into this toolkit? Well, what we really want is a system that's bespoke to design for security. Although we want to influence UK policing and hopefully international policing in the way that maybe urban design and planning is thought about, evaluated and monitored, we really want this to start with design for security itself. We want to be able to record and manage design for security workloads and projects so that the consultants can understand where each other are working, I can understand the density of work that we have within the team, and we can understand in general where we're going to get our peaks and troughs. 
We want to be able to measure the impact and the benefit to DFS and the recommendations we give. Do those recommendations get implemented? Do they survive? Do they live? And do they actually work? Do they actually prevent crime and help to reduce it in those areas that we know are disproportionately affected across the, the um, Greater Manchester area? And last but not least, we want to create a geographical picture of Greater Manchester and the work that we do, the benefit of the work that we do, but also let that build over time to help us to understand and evaluate the service of DFS. Thank you, Julia. Um, it's so refreshing to actually be able to present to real life people rather than just a screen and hopefully get some um, good, honest feedback as opposed to uh, emoji, thumbs up and smiley faces. So thank you. Um, so onto the toolkit and for many years there's been a buzzword about sustainability within architecture for, for many, many decades now because buildings are very intelligent and becoming more intelligent, um, being able to monitor themselves and understand how they're performing over the, over the years of their life cycle. And it's very important that we recognize that within crime prevention and the work that we do. And that's currently part of the big gap analysis that we identified earlier on in this stage of, uh, in this stage of the project, that we weren't reflecting on the work that we do. And the CCI project has come along at a great time um, uh, where we can now identify and, and build and develop a toolkit that will allow us to uh, retrospectively review the work that we do and um, support communities and also support the work uh, of our police communities. So the toolkit itself is designed selfishly initially for uh, the design for security team. So each consultant will have its own login page, have a, their own login identity which will then throw up, um, I don't know if throw up is the right term to use, but it will uh, present a picture of Greater Manchester and the work that we're all involved with and the amount of work. And we'll be able to identify where there are development hotspots. And it's important to, to make that distinction between um, the built environment development hotspots as opposed to crime hotspots, because we're not in the business of, um, of identifying where crime is actually taking place, but where um, development is taking place and how we can hopefully mitigate uh, and reduce crime um, across its, uh, its life cycle within those communities. So as you can see from this slide, uh, we've got a view of Greater Manchester where everybody is um, where everybody's working. I won't sort of take you through a, a dry um, presentation of a, of a website because I think I'd lose you within seconds. So the toolkit itself um, is giving us an overview of urban development across Greater Manchester. And within the toolkit, we already ask for um, a review what those various building uses and type, typologies are going to be for that specific building or that specific community. Uh, we'll also be looking at for sort of dwelling numbers as well. So we can, from this data that we're putting into the promised toolkit, we're able to extrapolate more information about these communities, how many people are going to be working and living within these areas. Again, the GIS mapping will allow us to um, track projects across their life cycle and these new communities will be able to uh, understand where the development hotspots are going to take place. And hopefully this will become intuitive and help us to um, have a greater conversation and greater understanding within Greater Manchester Police and our policing colleagues, sort of local policing teams, so that we can direct them on it or inform them of, of new communities that are taking place where there might be a, you know, 10,000 people living or working within a new area of Greater Manchester, which you know, some of our local policing teams aren't aware of. So it's important that they get this sort of future view two or five years into the future that there's going to be a new community of, of people living and, and working in, in these areas. So we'll be able to correlate the characteristics of different projects that hopefully that will sit side by side each other sometimes because there's a wealth of knowledge within within DFS, within 
within, the, um, within each consultant. But sometimes that's not necessarily understood when we sit down at, at team meetings that one consultant might have worked on a project five years ago. And so that knowledge sometimes isn't shared across the team. So hopefully, with this Promise Toolkit, the, the new panacea, um, uh, we might be able to sort of engage more with uh, and understand what's going on within development uh, areas and opportunities across Greater Manchester. And it will also support this idea of, uh, of the Secured by Design Achievement Award. So we'll be, at the end of a project, when we present the award, the SBD certificate, so two years maybe after that award has been presented, uh, the, the toolkit will have an alert system so that we can um, go back and review that particular project and understand where there has been success or failures with our recommendations. So we're making a, a giant leap from what we're currently working on at the minute, which is a, quite a dry Excel spreadsheet, um, and then into, into a very visual world. You know, the Excel spreadsheet for all its uh, uses, doesn't provide us with detailed information. It just tells us the life cycle of the project that sits with that consultant up until the end when the, the, the report is handed over or when the certificate is given to the, to the developer or the architect at the end of that project. But we then don't go back and review that particular project. So within uh, the Promise Toolkit, it will allow us to uh, team meetings, we'll be able to identify specific uh, local authorities of the, the 10 different boroughs within Greater Manchester, where there are sort of developments taking place across an annual basis or across a, a five-year basis, so that we can identify those particular, um, those particular authorities who aren't necessarily um, sending um, work through Design for Security, so we're not aware of, of uh, all the developments that are taking place. And we can build stronger relationships with those, those specific authorities. So the, during the actual team meetings, each project will have a, a, its own unique card with a bit of information. If we wish to delve into that specific project, then it will throw up another card which will have more specific information, more detailed information about that specific project. A, a project summary, a crime summary, some of the crime data and, a, and analysis that we produce, um, which is very unique for, for GMP in the work that we do. So during these team meetings, we, as a team, will have much more detailed information about everybody's workload across, uh, across Greater Manchester. And as Julia alluded to earlier, it, the toolkit will allow us to, to review the, the work and the business cycle of design for security on an annual basis. We'll be able to see where these peaks and troughs lie across the year. Now this is the big um, element that we talk about, is the ability to self-review ourselves and self-review the work that we get involved with. And we, undertake um, and we're involved with a national scheme which is secured by design and at the end of each of these projects um, they are awarded a, a secure by design certificate um, but what um, and we just hand that over shake hands with the developer and everybody walks away quite happily um, but then we don't understand what the the impact is of that uh, community it, it, you know are there uh, are the recommendations that we've requested and imposed, are they actually working? So it's important to then self-evaluate. Um, so the toolkit will have an alert system a year or two years down the line um, so that we can go back and review the crime stats of that specific project. And as the graph at the bottom indicates, hopefully those crime stats will have come down. Some, some crimes um, we probably can't, um, can't control um, and they, they might always exist but we can only do our best. So that's the main area that we are looking at with the, the Promise Toolkit. So the implementation uh, of the Promise Toolkit has been discussed and disseminated and developed on numerous occasions with the Design for Security team. 
Um, we've also presented it to our senior leaders and the evidence-based practice board within GMP. And we are now obviously at the, the final um, event. And we, over the next month, we've got two more implementation and, and demonstrations of the toolkit with Design for Security and the team who've had an immense uh, influence on developing this toolkit, which started out, uh, and I think Andrew referred to the issues of technology being this great panacea. And in the early days of, uh, of developing this toolkit, uh, we were quite guilty in, in going down that, that rabbit warren of, um, of technology can solve all these different problems and, and it can provide us with this information and provide us with that information. We can speak to these people and provide all these beautiful bits of maps and graphs. But what we needed to do was uh, reduce that and pair that back to the core principles of, of it working for design for security, allowing us to see visually where we're working across Greater Manchester, and that's really important. But ultimately, it's, it's, um, it's that self-analysis and, and, and a retrospective review of the work that we do. And so in conclusion then, it's a toolkit for design for security. Um, so we're the end users. It will help us promote the work and understanding of the work that we do within design for security it will allow us to build stronger, uh, stronger connections with the, the local authorities that we're not working strongly with. Um, and it will allow, ultimately, the service to evolve over many years, hopefully. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. To David and to Julia. We've got time for questions. Would anyone like to pose a question? Andrew would like to pose a question. Uh, thank you very much, Julia and David, for a very interesting presentation. And um, it just it's a question, but also more, probably more of a comment, is that um, the work that your team does and the amount of information that is gathered in creating the crime impact statement, uh, and I know that you do uh, site visits as part of that and collect detail about potential risks relating to particular sites, the, the fact that normally that data is only in the heads of the <laughs> consultants, that that will all be available in this database gives great opportunity for, um, you know, to do proper impact analysis over time um, that, that is just impossible when this sort of information isn't actually kept formally logged in that way. Uh, and I know that the Secure by Design scheme that you talked about that has been running for many years has even that has been very difficult to evaluate because it isn't properly recorded in the sort of level of detail that might help identify um, causal factors and be able to actually give proper uh, impact analysis. So I think it's quite exciting that you're potentially, by having this tool, you're also building a database. And speaking as a researcher, I can see that in the future <laughs> opportunities to sort of look back and actually see what the impact of crime prevention through urban design and planning is and provide a much better evidence base as to why we need to be doing this when we're designing our cities. So it's very, it's very, very inspiring. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. It's, uh, it's, it's really heartening to, it's really heartening, Andrew, that you find a database really exciting, so. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Thank you. Yep, I was expecting a question. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> 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 this is uh, the yeah. deal. No, no, uh, Julia and David, thanks very much for, for, for this presentation. Um, actually, what, 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 what it, it could mean is that uh, what the Americans call the foreseeability of crime. 
which is a, a, a topic that very often is not used um, in policies, but it can mean that if you do not take certain measures or protect uh, certain, let's say, surroundings or developers, then you, in America you might sue those developers. I won't say that is a policy for <laughs> Europe, but it, 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 in my opinion it, it holds because it can also be a very costly problem if you do not take the uh, right protective measures when building whatever. Because we have a couple of examples in the Netherlands of this costly, uh, uh, well, when uh, you have a sort of crime impact statement also, when it's not used, you have firm arguments when you have uh, those costs uh, later on and can say you didn't took protection measures and now we have a big financial problem. So yeah. that might be something to convince developers to actually take those preventive measures. I do not know if your system, I mean, already was mentioned, it's very difficult to, to think about costs, and, uh, but, but that might be something to convince people yes. to take those measures. Is, is there something in the system that you can build in, in the evaluation uh, part of it? That's the question. Uh, I, well, I think that's something that we can build in, um, but the initial, so the development of the toolkit so far has been trying to pair it back to the and, and not get carried away with some of those um, some of those ideals and I'm not I'm not uh, dismissing that as a, an important factor um, but uh, yeah we just needed to sort of pair it back to those core principles of having a, a mapping system and then being able to self-analyze and and, and, and um, review the, the impact that we do, but I think that's, that is an important point and it's something that we can hopefully build in. I think, um, uh, just to go, go further as well, that we're really keen to support the evidence base locally, nationally, internationally that already exists for this work. And we know that there's a social and a financial cost to, to getting this wrong um, when it's not implemented in the, in the first place. So. Um, as, as promised, the toolkit for design for security develops and we learn from the development. I mean, we've already had some massive learning uh, mm, experiences, yeah. haven't we? Um, as we learn ourselves, I think uh, hopefully we'll be able to strengthen that database with yeah. sharing some of that, that knowledge and that, that data. So we'll, we'll work out over time how we can do that efficiently. And, and when we switch <laughs> on uh, the promise toolkit, you know, if we, if we switch it on next week, there's not, it's not a huge bank of information there at the minute because uh, historically all our information, all our projects is kept on a database. Yeah. So um, we've developed with LOBA, we've handed them a, a handful of, of projects. So each consultant has provided five projects from their job bag so that when we do switch it on, we've got some information because um, buildings and communities don't happen overnight. You know, that these can take two, maybe five years to, to, to construction. Um, so, you know, we've got a gap there of, of no uh, data coming in and, and no self-reflection. So hopefully during this early initial period, we'll be able to uh, use the, the initial uh, 25 projects that are in the, in the system and start the clock running then. And during, whilst that's happening, also start to feed in historic, more historical projects so that we can understand and start um, self-reflecting. Is, that, is yeah. that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, just uh, sort of in, in, a bit in response to you, Yarp, it, it relates to what I was uh, talking about this morning in, in the new product development research. They quickly found that there isn't a uh, single key reason why things are successful and so they looked at um, correlation as opposed to causation and then they have success factors so projects that have x factor is more likely to be successful and I think that's what's exciting about this is we can start to say that projects that do this are more likely to have problems um, so it's not quite at the polluter pays type <laughs> being legally allowed to sue people, but it's certainly something that would start to give strong argument yeah. to saying we need to be enforcing this in Manchester or, you know, that this needs to be strongly encouraged because otherwise there's great cost to the police in dealing with the fallout. That's right.
Have we got any more questions? <laughs> so you, you spoke very <coughs> briefly earlier on about the sort of benefit of being able to explain new developments to your senior officers or other aspects of the police. Could you talk a bit more about the sort of strategic planning advantages that this that the system gives to the to the GMP as a force? Um, well, like I've explained, you know, the construction projects and new developments can take many years to, to, to come to fruition. And um, I don't think there's a system in place within our local policing teams that understand the planning process and understand what's, uh, what new communities are being constructed and new, new communities or workplaces that are being developed. Um, so this toolkit will allow us to, to sort of identify development hotspots um, and areas where there are new communities and so that we can have those conversations with our various local policing teams and say, look, two years down the line, you're going to have this huge community, this huge office development, whatever it might be, and therefore you might want to start thinking about resourcing and, um, you know, we've recommended certain conditions for, for this new development, they've been adopted. Um, but we will review these in time, uh, and therefore you need to be aware that there's going to be this new massive community <laughs> taking place on your doorstep. It's something that you need to bear in mind, something that you need to think about. So it allows our local policing teams an insight into, into new areas that are coming forward. David's been quite... Um uh, you identified, didn't you, an area of di development, and you actually brought that to our senior... Sorry. Um, our senior leadership, um, um, David, talked about a development that's happening in Salford um, at, at the planning stage and actually had the potential for mm. 10,000 new residents. Uh, yeah, plus. Plus other workers. And our, policing, our local policing teams were obviously extremely interested to understand that potentially they were going to have another 10,000 people landing on what at the moment is surface car parks. So they're quite interested in car crime there, but they were beginning to realise that that was going to really affect their resourcing. And so this is beginning now to affect the way that the command team and the senior policing officers within um, GMP are beginning to understand and work out how we can support that demand management and that demand reduction portfolio. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That was excellent. Um, just to say that our next presentation is from uh, the Estonian Police and Border Guard, if they'd like to come forward. Um, just to say, um, David mentioned um, LOBA. The um, excellent communication material that you can see here is, is produced uh, by LOBA, um, who are our communication uh, design partner. Um, but just to say that LOBA also actually worked on some of the tools um, to actually support their development, and they worked particularly on the promise tool. So that's um, where the input has come from, from the development of the promise tool, which was one of our more technology um, orientated um, outputs. Okay, so I'm very pleased then to move on to our second crime prevention through urban design and planning tool, and that's called Building Safe, Safer Cities Together. And I'd like to introduce you to Kaiser Kagu and Kelly Maido, who are from the Estonian Police and Border Guard. So if you'd like to come up, thank you very much. So hello everyone, uh, my name is Kelly, and also I'm here with our project manager, Kaisa, who is sitting down there. <laughs> she didn't want to come up here, so I have to handle it alone. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to talk about our topic, which was building safer cities together. Uh, so, no? Again, it's the same mistake. 
yeah, the problem. Uh, in the beginning, the main question was, uh, what is security? After discussions and research, we agreed on one thing. Every human being uh, perceives it uh, differently. Some talk about traffic, some talk about environment, uh, but uh, our focus in the project is a safe and secure living environment for all the residents, and uh, we will work for the we, we would work with the partners and uh, communities to prevent different cr crimes. Uh, mainly, this means that we need to de develop a common approach within the police and border guard board for the development of safe living environment. So about the background, in the beginning of 21st century, there were this CE and process in 2000. After the process came together, police and border guard board, different NGOs, local authorities, and national neighborhood watch umbrella organizations. And also it was a national thing uh, in the process, we made the uh, CPTED manual uh, for the police officers, which was meant for use to different work areas. The main aim was to help communicate uh, with a wider audience of the users. There were community police officers, there were local authorities and uh, city design officials. Uh, so, as we started, we really realized that uh, crime prevention by urban design and planning is not well understood. Uh, there remains uh, no common uh, understanding of the role uh, of Estonian police with uh, other urban design stakeholders within uh, an effective integrated CPUDP strategy for urban development. Uh, so to become an uh, expert partner in the planning process, the Estonian police needs to adopt a more professional uh, crime prevention throughout urban design and planning expert role. Uh, furthermore, there is a lack of communication between uh, such as stakeholders. And also, while the legislation does not recommend that uh, crime and security aspect be addressed in the planning process, it does not obligate, obligate planners to coordinate or consult uh, with the police about the planning uh, process. So consequently, uh, urban design and planning does not currently take security aspect into account uh, when they are assessing uh, design. Uh, that leads us to the consequences uh, where the police officers being led to deal with, uh, with the consequences of, uh, of poor design. So, sorry. So currently, if, uh, if the plans are submitted to the police for, a, for an option or a opinion, uh, the work process in, in the police and border guard board is also quite uh, chaotic and also case-based. Uh, to become an expert partner in the planning process, uh, the Estonian police needs to adopt a more professional crime prevention throughout urban design and planning expert role. This requires for us clearer definition of the role within the police organization uh, and how we can deliver consistently over the long term. Uh, unless the crime prevention throughout urban design and planning is uh, followed by all the stakeholders in an urban development, it will have no effect uh, currently, while the Estonian police supports CPTED principles, this approach is not always endorsed by local planners or, or architects um, or development businesses also. So in our research, we found out that as the law does not uh, require required that development uh, plans should be co coordinated uh, with the police and border guard board, uh, then this cooperation is not made use of. Uh, we're pointed out that there should be some uh, 
mandatory requirements for the local authorities to include a secure, security expert for certain objects and in the topic we should cooperate and raise awareness with the, with the population. Uh, so the tool, uh, we, we have three uh, different ingredients uh, in our tool. Uh, so there is a training program, policy guidance and uh, process protocol that uh, enables the Estonian police to support the eff effective planning, design and uh, development of safe urban environment. So the tool needs to promote uh, interdisciplinarity. There should be no extra bureaucracy and be easily accessible and also easy to use. So the first uh, tool we created is a training program. In the training program is brought together police, planners, architects and uh, developers to develop a common uh, understanding of crime prevention to, throughout urban design and planning and their role uh, in deliver, delivering it. So we are, we took together all the parties about uh, planning. So the aim was to create uh, a common understanding of uh, security for all the stakeholders in uh, urban, de urban design and planning, fostering of connection of crime prevention throughout urban design and planning with uh, other stakeholders, including lo local government, planners, architects, and so on, uh, clarifying the role in crime prevention throughout urban design and planning of different stakeholders or training par participant uh, discussions of real and evidential place based security problems, development of shared solutions where, where possible acceptably to all the parties that, uh, that are included, and providing a platform for building relationship and supporting the exchange of knowledges. So the training program uh, uh, test uh, was done uh, of the prototype, uh, was done at uh, last year, summer. Uh, it is a two-day training program that includes uh, theory part and practical part. Uh, the theory part consists of, consists of uh, four topics, environmental psychology, architecture, planning process as a hard view, and also the police view, so the different parties can know what the others uh, may think about the different situation, and also uh, the practice uh, where there is a field work, uh, virtual simulation center. Uh, as you can see, there is also a photo uh, of our prototype. Uh, it is, it's not picture, but really it is a program where you can uh, go around, watch different places. And the aim is to, uh, to show the architects and police together uh, what they should do in this environment. And after that, there is uh, different presentations. And uh, the training program will start uh, uh, in January 2022. Uh, so the second tool is uh, policy guidance. Uh, from here, I would like to say that uh, crime can be prevented throughout urban planning, cooperation between the police and uh, spatial planning pro partners is important at an early stage, as we realized that. And also to raise awareness, uh, we compiled policy guidance for, uh, for the parties and also for the police officers. Uh, so in the policy guidance, there is three main topics. Definition of the role from the police in crime prevention throughout urban design and planning. Uh, also overview of plans for the future, like where are we, where do we want to be in the future, how do we get there, what kind of next steps do we have. And also identification of the main partners that the police will work uh, within uh, crime prevention throughout urban design and planning. So if someone would like to learn Estonian, then, uh, <laughs> then this policy guidance is uh, 
uh, back there on the table. So maybe someone can learn, meanwhile, Estonian also. And uh, the Estonian police uh, process protocol, uh, which is the third tool, uh, it consists of three main uh, inst instructions. Uh, how to communicate with uh, appropriate partners on security problems, how to provide evidence-based insight on security issues relating to existing development, developments and locations for purpose new developments, to, sorry, to propose new developments, and uh, how and when to give feedback uh, to the partners. So how we got here, uh, we had different workshops, there were so many of them, uh, with the community police officers, planners, architects and the different NGOs. Uh, we also had the focus group uh, interviews with, uh, with the experts. Uh, we made a CIP, uh, CPTED uh, survey, which was an uh, online survey, and uh, it was among local authorities and community police officers to really know about what they know about the CPTED and how much they are using it uh, in their work. Also, the job shadowing at local authorities, uh, expert interviews with uh, local planners, uh, different discussions and different meetings also. And we had in the Estonian Academy of Security Science uh, Innovational Lab or workshop, uh, where we created the first example of the training program and also the CCI curriculum uh, testing. Uh, so about the demonstration, uh, the demonstration was uh, carried out uh, last year. Uh, there were, it, it was introduced to ministry officials, Estonian security science uh, officials, um, in a conference, uh, uh, in the training program to the police officers and uh, in introduced to uh, local authorities, officials, planners and police officers uh, throughout Skype. So about implementation. Uh, implementation was carried out uh, firstly uh, in April this year when we had a national uh, in implementation workshop held in DEDEX style in Tallinn. Uh, because of the COVID restrictions, uh, we had to broadcast it uh, online. There attended uh, 156 police officers, architects, urban planners, and uh, policy makers. There was uh, also a questionnaire uh, where the attendees had to answer uh, how, what do they know about the uh, police work? Uh, are they cooperating with police or the urban planners or the local authorities? And there was 60% of, uh, of attendees do not uh, cooperate with uh, each other. So it was kind of sad to, to see that. But after the workshop, uh, we had new questionnaire and uh, the process percent for uh, quite lower. Uh, also, the implementation uh, workshop held at community policing seminar, which we usually have every year, about the topics that are acute uh, at the time. And uh, also, I'm going a bit further. Next slide. I'm going to talk about the, our Tondiraba project. And also, in summer, uh, next year, there is uh, going to be completed the uh, reconstruction work at the, from the Rago Park, uh, which is also one of the parks in, uh, in Tallinn. So, about this Tondiraba case. Uh, in this project, the police was really involved as a security expert. Uh, police officers participated uh, in all meetings. Uh, even if the, if the topic did not uh, involve the police directly. But it was important because uh, police knows people's behavior, habits, uh, patterns, and can speak along uh, almost in every topic. 
Uh, it is also important to know people's constant movement or daily, beha daily behavior habits. The main problem is people who consume alcohol in uh, public uh, places. Uh, and in addition, you must also take people and people with different hobbies into account when you are a reconstruction reconstruction of a park. Uh, so, for example, the both pedestrians and cyclists were earlier using the same road for sporting. Uh, the moving directions were not splitted, so there were many misunderstandings among people and they really had to be careful. So there was no, no time for sporting because you had to be so careful about the others. There was also a problem with different uh, barbecue platforms, uh, which were earlier between the houses. Uh, it is Im important to emphasize that it, there is no distinction that the person lives in town or a countryside. Uh, whenever they want to barbecue, they would just choose the comfortable place. Even in Tallinn, they would choose the comfortable place for themselves and will barbecue. Uh, so here uh, is the possibility to provide people an opportunity to barbecue while knowing that the police and rescue can easily provide assistance if it is needed. So we created a secure environment for, for them. Uh, so, uh, in this picture, as you can see, the various platforms are planned uh, to close proximity to re resistance buildings. Uh, from previous experience, uh, we have received almost every night complaints about some areas uh, which have been linked to a violation of the peace at night time. Uh, for example, someone plays ball, ball or rides a skate park with skateboard. When the police usually gets there, it appeared that young people are just chilling and, uh, and spending their time there without any violation of the law. Uh, so around the park were created so-called uh, green area to suppress the noise from the park uh, in order to reduce the disturbance to the nearby residents. Uh, this park is really meant for different community groups and their daily hobbies. Uh, as you can see in white, there are different things you can do in this park. Um, and that allows each person to deal with uh, their different hobbies. Would it be walking a dog, even maybe walking a cat, uh, playing with children, uh, there is also some kind of uh, railway road where you can hang out. Uh, there can you, you can play basketball, ride with the skateboard. Uh, also there is gym, uh, outdoor gyms. Uh, so here you can see the road where you can uh, uh, do running or cycling or walking, even hiking. Uh, so also, in this topic, I would like to say that uh, in Estonia, one of the simplest ways to make sense of ownership uh, is considered to be installation of different cameras. Uh, but uh, really, it does not hold off the offenses. Uh, the bum sees the camera and goes to another place to complete his or her, her work or the aim of, of the work. However, it is great for a fact that there the clear camera can show us uh, who did something, who vandalized or stole something. But it is uh, important to emphasize that the environment should already be proactive in itself. Uh, so also they will install some of the individual cameras, uh, but uh, we had uh, we had the room uh, to put down some electricity cables uh, in different places to install cameras uh, in the need uh, if there occurs uh, any, any new problem. So yeah, that's all for me. Thank you for listening and now it's the time for the questions.
Thank you very much, Kelly. Very interesting to hear about um, the tool, how it's been implemented, and what it's like in Estonia as well. So, have we got any questions from the floor? Thank you, Maurice. Uh, not a question, just I want to say uh, thank you uh, for the last uh, few um, words with the cameras. Uh, <laughs> uh, that, I, I don't know uh, how it is in, in your um, cities or, or countries. We we um, have always the problem that from the policy, if there are problems, uh, they want cameras. And then I can say we have, we have done something for the security. And nothing changes. Uh, only the spots or the uh, loca lo locations where the um, uh, the people are or the citizens are, uh, they change, and then you run them uh, behind with the cameras. Um, yes, uh, I don't know if, if there is any research or if there is a, uh, is um, uh, or studies which really say that prevention with cameras. Perhaps it can help a little bit, but it's not it's not the solution. That's uh, that's for me. Uh, that's that's a question. If we could uh, work there together, we had it tomorrow. There's uh, the technicus king. Um, where is he? Um, Paul. Paul in in Paul's presentation and uh, the 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 toys for the boys. Uh, that's for me. <laughs> that's that's all this camera stuff. And uh, yes, thank you. And perhaps the, the question for the study is if there is in Estonia something and we can translate from Estonian to, <laughs> to, to German, <laughs> I would be very um, uh, thankful for that. Did you want to add something? Uh, yeah, I, I would like to comment a bit. Uh, so uh, about the cameras, right now we don't have uh, any current researches, but the cameras, the idea of uh, of making an ownership, uh, sense of ownership. It basically came from the CPTED manual for us. Uh, so yeah, it's been uh, for years the idea that we put the camera somewhere and there is all, everything okay, but now we can see that it's not helping. And that is one of the reasons why we put down the electrical cables and it is new practical, uh, practice in uh, different uh, parks also. When there occurs another problem in another place, then we can put the cameras there. But yeah, it may move around. Sorry. Thank you. Andrew, did you want to add something? Just, uh, I had a question regarding the training. Who, who, who's involved in the training? I mean, who is the training for? Is it just police officers, or is it also architects and? Yeah, it's uh, it's for the police officers, architects, planners, and uh, training program program is taking place uh, together with them. Like there, for example, there are three three police officers, three planners, three local authorities, two, uh, three. Uh, some other experts over there. So yeah, it is important to know throughout this training program how the others think or work, what they are looking for, what they are, they are seeing uh, in this environment. So that is why we had the prototype also. Thank you. Over to Jean Guido, I think you'd like to ask a question. Thank you for your presentation. Just this curiosity, during the training uh, and the, 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 the procedure is quite clear to me, uh, very smooth. Uh, do you face some resistance by some stakeholder or uh, much more difficulties involving neighborhood watch unit or planners or so on? Well, uh, for now, I can say that uh, uh, communication and uh, cooperation with uh, different parties uh, in Estonia, it's uh, pretty good. Uh, different partners are coming along with us. Right now, we just about the planning process. Uh, there are no knowledge about the, uh, the involvement of the police because it is not needed uh, from the law. Uh, and that's why we need to do ourselves more work uh, to get in this process and and to 
to be part of planning process for for all the time. So yeah, right now we are we are having a bit uh, rough time <laughs> to to be part of it. But uh, uh, there will be. I hope there is going to be a brighter future. And also the training program uh, helps it because uh, there are different parties, as I said already. Also, uh, we included uh, the police and police and border guard college, uh, also the Estonian Academy of uh, Arts, uh, where, com where are coming the future architects and, uh, and urban planners, designers, and we are co cooperating with uh, them also to, to have this knowledge uh, uh, for the younger police officers also. I hope that uh, that was answered to your question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Has anyone else got any questions? Or want to make any final comments? Yup, you don't want to say anything? <laughs> I, thought, I thought you might want to add something. That, 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 that tricked my mind because the, 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 the answer to your question is, uh, are, is CCTV effective? Yes. Um, it depends on, on what locations it, it's, it's being applied and, and with other interventions, of course, but especially on this topic, on, on, on cameras and CCTV, there, there has been some very thorough research being done. And there are two recent systematic evaluations or reviews that clearly uh, uh, state that under circumstances, depending on what uh, location CCTV is used, it, it is effective by a 18 or 19 percent or something like that. It's being uh, done by Mr. Pizza in New York. I know he's the one who did the, and by David Farrington and, and colleagues. Uh, so if you are interested, I can send it to the LKA. Uh, um, anyway, so, so, um, Yes, it, it's effective, and, and, and the thing that, that's another myth that, that occurred that on crime displacement. Crime uh, moves to the corner, as we say. That's another myth, because there's also being, I think, around three or four very thoroughful systematic reviews that clearly state that crime displacement does occur, but never for 100%. There's always a net effect. So, just... From a knowledge base, um, uh, that's well, a couple, that's what I wanted to, to uh, at least to state. Because uh, very often there's lots of negative talk about cameras and about crime displacement, but very often it's the other way around. Thanks. Yes, that's right. The potential diffusion of benefits you can also have, and yep, you're, you're quite right. So thank you very much to Kelly. And just to thank all the people that have pres presented today, I do appreciate that for many people, they're having to present in English, which isn't their first language. I live in Germany, and I know it's one thing to talk to friends in a foreign language, <coughs> but actually to present on stage to everyone, that isn't easy. So a warm round of applause to everybody that presented today. Thank you very much. I've been reliably informed that lunch is ready um, and that we should come back at 1400 hours. Thank you very much. Okay, if we'd like to make a start. You'll get intro music in a second. If we could have the introductory music, please.
Welcome back after lunch. And uh, I'm Caroline Davy, and this is Andrew Wooten, and we're going to be presenting the European security model. So European security model, a human-centered conceptualization of security. So CCI and the European security model, why were we looking at this? Well, the concept of security, of a security model, could seem something rather abstract. The need for a better defined European security model was outlined actually in the Horizon 2020 research program. We were in particular asked in CCI to provide a definition of a European security model. But how might we do this? So CCI undertook some research to understand the European security model in its current form. We reviewed the literature and we conducted interviews with security practitioners and with policy makers. Now, I have to say that when we first started looking for the European security model, we were actually expecting a visual representation of European security. We didn't manage to find that, but we did find some documents um, that outlined an approach to European security. But having said that, what we found then is that there seemed to be rather a gap in terms of the knowledge that was out there. So in terms of a European security model, there wasn't one that we could find. Thank you. Well, that side. So uh, having looked at the documents, there is various references to European security model. And having done the interviews with various experts, there were people who uh, sort of claimed to have seen something um, uh, and there was this idea that in fact the European security model was a bit like the Yeti in that there was lots of uh, sightings of it but there was no photographic evidence of its existence um, and it seems to have been something that's come through uh, it's coming in and out of fashion and it's been in certain um, policy documents over the years uh, but it is very much something that people, some people will claim that they've seen it, but they can't describe it. Um, but having done the work that we did, and, uh, and uh, Paul Van Sumeren and his team at DSP that were leading on looking into the background on the security model, uh, we decided that in fact the, the European security model didn't actually exist and that effectively the Yeti was dead. And so we set about uh, creating our own version of a European security model, or we asked ourselves the question, well, what is a European security model then? Um, and went through a process of trying to answer that and build a CCI view or vision of what a European security model might actually be. So just to start off in terms of clarifying things, what is a model? Models are, are very much used in the sciences. As Caroline said, we expected to find visual models of things. Um, in fact, in the sciences, as this uh, quote from John, no John Neumann says, is, you know, it's, it's ma mainly what the sciences do is make models. And conceptual modeling can mean a number of things, but at the end of the day, it's about describing some aspects of the physical and social world in a way of, uh, that enables it to be better understood and easier communicated. And so what we were looking at something was, we were looking for something that was a visual model, uh, so that it is a way of thinking about issues uh, and, or, and basically using a model that's organized around real world ideas to better understand problems, uh, to better understand systems and structures, and to basically better communicate with all the different stakeholders in this uh, European security circus that, that exists. Um, and the, as we discussed, and as we, in the work we did yesterday in the workshop, abstraction uh, is a fundamental human capability that enables us to deal with complexity, and that's why models are often very useful for dealing with complex ideas. And so a model is an abstraction that portrays the essentials of a complex system or structure, 
but the non-essential details are filtered out to make it easier to understand. So the challenge we had was to develop a conceptual model <coughs> using visual modeling of the concept European security. And this is what we did in one of our design labs that we ran with the consortium and the advisory board members. Uh, and we undertook various activities rather like you undertook with us yesterday afternoon, involving lots of post-it notes, although ours had the unhappy exception of being online and not physically together. Um, but developing these various models of what we thought European security as a concept might mean, and then anal analyzing that and trying to define what the challenges were, what are the obstacles, and also fundamentally, what are the guiding principles around European security. And from this work, we came up with a perspective which um, echoes uh, some of what Paul talked about us this morning in his policy paper, is that European security strategy and research to a certain degree tends to focus mainly on big scary issues. So we have our terrorism, disasters, organized crime and the rest. There is some focus on petty crime um, and there is some focus on uh, citizens' feelings of insecurity. And that while there are many practitioners around this sort of area, most citizens are actually living more over this sort of area. And that the tools and uh, the outputs that get produced may be quite um, transient in that from the work we did looking historically at tools that have been produced, often they were unavailable or they disappeared, um, or in fact, there was no trace of them at all. So the idea was that this was a sort of a, a contextual map of the domain, if you like, of European security strategy and research focus. So, so we felt that um, our, we had a number of propositions about our conceptual model of European security. The first being that for petty crime to be addressed, the model should be citizen focused because by focusing on the citizens pretty much guarantees that petty crime is going to have to be part of it. And that concerns around citizen trust and ideas about legitimacy actually Re echoed quite a number of other concerns that were happening uh, around uh, issues with larger organizations. We know that Brexit's not the only exit that is being discussed in politics across Europe, but some of these ideas are around legitimacy and trust are being hijacked by voices on the right. And that security problems and priorities actually change over time. So that a model should be crime agnostic rather than focused around a particular crime that may be big today, but in five years maybe is less, less, uh, less of an issue. And then um, the economic benefit, which is something that's built within the um, security research program, this idea of a security economy, actually flows from implemented solutions. So the emphasis should be, based, uh, should be placed on implementation because it's through implementation of good ideas that you actually get the economic benefit. So it should be about developing the right solution that addresses the right problem uh, and the right context of use. And finally, uh, we, uh, we discussed there being a European difference, if you like, to security as it is conceived and performed in Europe. And that this is a sort of an aspect of what we termed European exceptionalism. So, our model. We start off at the base level with this idea of European values. There are European values talked about in many documents. They cover a whole range of different things. We have freedom, fundamental rights, democratic control, transparency and accountability, dialogue, equality, justice and the rule of law, truth and integrity, respect for ethics. I think it's very difficult to argue against these as being core European values. We added to this list this idea of European exceptionalism, the idea that there is a, a shared history or approach to Europe which is different from when you go east and different from when you go west in the States. So on these values, we suggest there are a number of what we call principles of European security. The central principle being citizen-centered. European security is citizen-centered. 
And by this, we mean it's organized around human needs and priorities. The second principle is that it's transdisciplinary. So that it involves engaging with and working across multiple disciplines, seeking others' expertise and worldviews, valuing holistic approaches. The third principle being that it's preventative. So it's about prioritizing prevention. It's proactive, it's strategic and intelligent, and it's about preventing harm. The fourth principle is that it's collaborative. So it's about working together, engaging with partners, recognizing shared problems, goals, and interests, creating consortiums, partnerships, and teams. And the final principle is that it's what we called demonstrable or demonstrable. And by this, we mean that it's evidence-based, it values the tested and the demonstrated, it's rational, it's analysis-driven, it's practical and context-appropriate, and it's evaluated. So on top of these values and principles, we identified that there was action that flowed from these principles. And the action could actually be uh, attributed to various of these principles. So, for example, for the citizen-centered principle, we saw, first of it, firstly, the action being to understand citizen behavior and priorities and their perspective. So this means enabling improved understanding of citizens' experience, perceptions, behaviors, to better address problems and create appropriate and acceptable solutions. The second action under the citizen-centered or on the citizen-centered principle was that it should promote and support community-based approaches so that European security enables and empowers European citizens to contribute to security. This includes supporting community-based initiatives in member states that attempt to co-opt co citizens into the creation of their safer neighborhoods. So on the transdisciplinary principle, we saw the first action as being to engage and benefit from all disciplines. So this is recognizing the benefit of engaging a broad range of disciplines in tackling complex societal challenges and contexts and supporting transdisciplinary action. As Paul said earlier, security is not just a police role or a criminal justice role. And the second action here was to meaningfully engage with civil society. So valuing and ensuring genuine engagement with civil society in scoping and addressing security issues. And in the preventative principle, we saw the first action being to promote and support preventative approaches. So that means uh, promoting proactive prevention activities and supporting the development of improved strategic capability in effective preventing security issues. And the second action being to identify emerging and future problems. So that's the foresight aspect of prevention. So developing an understanding of emerging problems and supporting development of appropriate preparedness for future challenges. And then over the collaborative principle, we saw the action, the first action being to address problems across states. So recognize the shared nature of problems and goals, supporting problem solving across member states to address cross-border and transnational issues, supporting member states to work together to improve effectiveness in tackling common problems. The second action here being to share solutions across member states and agencies. So supporting the sharing of solutions across states and between the various agencies involved in creating security. And the third action here being to promote and solve, uh, sorry, promote and support partnership working. So that's encouraging and enabling inter-organizational working partnerships, collaborations to more effectively tackle security issues. And over the final principle, demonstrable, we saw the actions, the first action being to understand problems and context. 
so to support and enable improved systemic understanding and framing of problems through high quality contextual research that provides real insight. This is something that came from CCI and the value of our LEAs in actually digging down and understanding their, their context and their needs. The second action being to prototype test with end users. So to maximize the feasibility, practicality, and acceptability of solutions through prototype testing with end users early and often, and thereby support implementation. And finally, to focus, to, sorry, to assess impact and share what works and why. So support practical assessment of policies, strategies, solutions to better understand what works, why it works, and to share it with the relevant practitioners and stakeholders. So what we had is a model where we have European values, which we see as being sort of cultural values of Europeans. And on, this, on these values, we have value-based principles. And above that, we have principle-based action. And what this is all doing is trying to support practitioners who are responsible to deliver to uh, citizens, European citizens, and, and make them safer. And when we looked at this model, we thought, OK, so this is a conceptual model of what European security is. What is the role of the Commission in this? So. We thought about what the EC is for and how the EC is, uh, how it is embodied, and we thought, well, the role of the Commission is to act as a guardian of what we uh, slightly ironically termed, termed the flame of uh, enlightenment, of European enlightenment. So they're guardians of this flame of values. And their role is to promote these principles, and their role is to support principled action, and their role is to uh, improve and en enlarge capability, and finally is to deliver uh, improvement uh, in, uh, for citizens, and to actually to deliver European security. Caroline. Thank you very much. So. This is a conceptual model of European security, and I hope you'll agree that it presents a coherent framework for European security strategies in the context of value-based principles and principle-based action. We would suggest that it allows for a structured critical assessment of the breadth of security research and strategy, and that includes the European Security Research Programme. It provides a framework for future security research topics and areas, enabling a vision for security that engages with fundamental European values. And I think it also communicates the breadth of security policymaker and law enforcement roles and supports service and capability development. It raises questions, though, as to the appropriateness of security policy focusing on these narrow, high-profile risks while failing to address the broader issues that impact citizens' daily lives, so-called petty crime. But what we think is that addressing petty crime is actually implicit within this European security model, because to be citizen-centred, security must address the issues that impact citizens' everyday lives. And this includes not only everyday crimes, but also citizens' feelings of insecurity. It is transdisciplinary in its approach, which is something that we all know you have to have uh, when you're addressing petty crime. And you can see that in particular, for instance, with regard to crime prevention through urban design and planning, the way in which it brings together different disciplines, different stakeholders, different professionals. The principle of prevention 
is key to tackling petty crime and to reducing harm to citizens. And we know that prevention in this area really does work. And there's so much good practice around with regard to tackling petty crime. And that good practice should be ac shared across member states and between policymakers and between um, policymakers and practitioners. And in fact, when we were discussing community policing earlier today, uh, Monica, for instance, talked about the fact that she had gone to the UK to look at their community policing practices, and that's what's inspired some of the work that's been done in Lisbon. And now other countries are looking at what Lisbon are doing and then being inspired by the work that has been done there. There is a lot of evidence about what works and why in terms of addressing petty crime. And some of that evidence comes from the fact that we had the International Crime Victimization Survey. And we need that evidence to know what really works. And we need it also because we need to look ahead, because obviously the nature of crime changes and we need the knowledge to be able to tackle the emerging crimes that occur. So that is the European security model. As you can see, it is a visual representation. You can all confirm that it really does exist now. We have stuffed and mounted the Yeti. <laughs> and so I open it to the floor to see if anybody's got any questions about the European security model or any feedback. Please do. I'm Günter Dauen from uh, Campus Vesta, a training center here in Belgium for first responders. Um, I have a question in general. Do you believe that Brexit, you mentioned it, uh, but also COVID will have an impact on uh, the development and the speeding up of the development of this model that you visualized here now? But I'm sure that policymakers in Europe will be seeing the, the big challenges arising from the two um, problems that I mentioned. Do you think that they are going to speed up the building of this security policy? Oh, I, I mean, I think it's a sort of a push and a pull, really. Things like COVID have, and, and the work that's been done to create a vaccine in such short amount of time has, has probably done more to bring certain types of science together. I don't think there should be any reason why it shouldn't be used as a springboard for other things. With regard to Brexit, I'm, uh, I'm afraid I have to uh, say that I have an interest there. Um, and, and I would hope that that doesn't impact on, the, on this. This model is very much based on a, a concept of security that is European, which I think holds true. Um, probably irrespective, we're still sharing knowledge across this uh, invisible border that now exists. Um, and I would hope that that uh, might change in the future more positively, but who knows? Um, but I, I would hope that the, the idea that we have a sort of an approach in Europe that, uh, that has these fundamental values and principles, I think is something that I, th I think is uh, something that at least if it's, if it's named, it's something we can maybe, if it doesn't exist already, we can aim towards. But I think in some parts, this is sort of how it works anyway. I mean, we've developed the model based on our experience through CCI and through having done the work together. Uh, and we think this is a fair embodiment of what European security means. Yes, just to say with regard to Brexit then, you know, obviously being involved in a project like CCI that has brought, you know, so many countries together, including the UK, um, it's really frustrating mm. that we have a situation uh, with Brexit um, because I think um, there's a lot um, that we value from working together with partners. We learn such a lot um, because of the very different context and the very different approaches. And... You know, some of this work that we've done, uh, we would never have been able to do um, if we'd been doing that only in the UK. So from our point of view, um, we're not happy about the situation with regard to Brexit, obviously, 
and we just hope that in terms of um, Horizon Europe, then um, that it's still possible for the UK to continue to contribute. So yes, it is a, a frustrating situation, but you know, one that obviously we hope that we can deal with in, in some way. So thank you. Would anyone else like to ask a question or make a comment? No, nope, no more comments. So we, there, there is a draft uh, briefing around this that we can, uh, we will hand out. There will be a uh, one of the deliverables from CCI is a policy paper around the European security model. What we've done is created a draft, a draft briefing paper just for today to be able to share something with you, um, because we're aware there's a lot of information to try and retain or take home. So this sort of is a summary of what uh, has been presented today, but we'd really welcome feedback. Feel free to email us or, or give us any of your feedback. In terms of um, a European security model, then obviously um, in this case, then we have aimed this at European security policy makers. And so whether it gets taken up will depend very much um, on how they uh, receive it, whether it seems to hit some of the values or some of the challenges that they're facing. Um, we very much hope that this is an interesting um, approach and that um, all of you here will find some value in, in the work that we've done. Um, obviously, through the workshop that we did yesterday, um, we, you went through some of the um, workshop activity that we uh, went through in order to create the model. And so what you'll find is that a lot of the values that were actually expressed yesterday, I think, are encaptured um, in this model. So I'm hoping that you will feel some affinity to, to the approach and to the values that are embodied um, within it. And as I say, from our point of view, it's in a very exciting challenge that really came out uh, because of the funding call, um, but it was something that I think has been of real value at the end of CCI um, because we've been very focused on developing tools and I think it's been important to lift our game to think about the policy implications and then to think overall what kind of vision have we got at a European level at, in a conceptual way and um, so we've been very pleased to be to be involved in developing this so so if there's no more questions... Oh, no, there is a question. <laughs> it's the usual, the usual suspect. If to you'll, you'll need the, the microphone, microphone yeah. Uh, do you also have... Sorry. Do you also have a PDF available? Because I can forward it to quite a number of people, if allowed to forward Yes, definitely. It. Yes, of course. So that makes it more easy, because, well... It's... it's the Yeti exists, I, I would say, and that would be the title of, of the mail <laughs> sent to various parties. So if, if available, please, so then I can forward it to other stakeholders. We'll, we'll certainly do that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is there, is there a microphone on? The light, the light is right. Okay. okay. <laughs> would you mind if I start providing an, an Italian translation? Because I think it would contribute <laughs> to a much better diffusion around the country. So. We, we would be delighted. If anyone wants to translate the document, we would be delighted. That would be excellent. Thank you very much, Roberto. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, thank you. <laughs> so, thank you for all your questions. And we're now moving on to our closing speaker. Um, Elizabeth Johnson is the Executive Director of the European Forum for Urban Security, EFIS. And as you know, EFIS have been our partner in CCI and 
She had planned to be here today in person. Um, unfortunately, as you know, with COVID, uh, things can change very quickly. And so yesterday she found out that she's not able, unfortunately, to be with us today. But she very kindly yesterday recorded her speech um, so that we can play it um, for you. So thank you very much to Elizabeth Johnson for going to all that effort to record a presentation for us. And hopefully the technology will work and she will come onto the screen. I'm sorry I can't be with you. I thought until the very last minute I could try to make it work, but uh, no schools this week in my family, so I had to stay home. Thank you, Carolyn, for giving us the opportunity to speak at this closing session of the conference. Uh, and mostly thank you, Carolyn Hay, the University of Salford, and the whole CCI consortium for years of fruitful collaboration. My teammates and I, Lucy Pida Pedatore and Puri Nesh, who's with you today, really enjoyed working with you on this project over the last three years. The learnings and the outputs of these projects are very valuable to nephews. And I'd like to offer just a few words very briefly of how we plan to take this forward uh, and capitalize on these years of our common work. For those of you who don't know us yet, nephews is a network of European uh, local and regional authorities. Many of you in the room are also members of uh, EFUSE, and we aim to support local and regional authorities in their everyday policies, tackling crime by tackling crime, preventing violence by bringing them knowledge. And this is why such projects are of such importance to us. EFUSE aims to amplify the voices of local and regional authorities and highlight the unique position to understand citizens and residents' concerns. And this is something that I think is very fundamental to the project and to our objective. Of course, our mayors are tackling issues that are very visible, very dramatic, like a terrorist attack or even homicides. But what they're also very concerned with, and what is of central importance to us as well, is the daily uh, experiences of crime and insecurity. Burglaries, robberies, assault. This is sometimes called petty crime, and this is a topic of much discussion. The words, uh, whether it's called petty crime or everyday crime, um, we know that it is what impacts the quality of lives of citizens. So it, it is what impacts citizens in their daily life, at home, in the streets, uh, on public transportation, and of course in public space. So the perception of insecurity is something that is absolutely fundamental to us. And this is why we think cities and local and regional authorities in general are absolutely key and instrumental in collecting, assessing, and analyzing these perception of insecurity. We believe that um, the assessment phase, the diagnosis phase, is a crucial prerequisite for any long-term effective policy. So this means taking into account very different perceptions of security held by all of the different components of a city, all of the different categories of residents, whether they be temporary or permanent, um, citizens or, res or visitors, men or women, of course, also young people or old people. All of these categories need to be integrated. And this is why we very um, strongly support the methodology of local safety audits. Through the safety audits, cities can gather comprehensive knowledge of their security issues and go beyond the apparent most visible, most uh, obvious phenomenon uh, of crime to better understand what really concerns their citizens and what they should mobilize resources around it. So this is to say that this is not a technical issue, but something that really needs to promote inclusiveness, inclusion of citizens and participation of citizens. And the human-centered approach of CCI that was developed throughout the project really can, um, inspired us to mobilize this knowledge and to try to also our local safety audit process. So I'm excited now that thanks to this project, thanks to this collaboration, we have a whole new range of tools 
changes that support the inclusion of local um, stakeholders uh, and methods that also foster participative, which are really easier said than done. We know we want to uh, gather their citizens' feelings of uh, fear of crime, their experiences, their perception, and this is not an easy undertaking. So this is why we've been very grateful to have been part of this project, uh, to identify new models, new tools, to exchange about what work, what, what works, what doesn't, and find these processes of participation, which are very uh, fashionable. Everyone talks about participation, but it's easier said than done once again. We've really welcomed the opportunity to share the tools that were developed and discussed throughout uh, the CCI project and throughout the two days of this final conference with our members. We've produced some fact sheets that are specifically for our members, fact sheets, practice sheets, and that we hope will continue to facilitate the transfer of tools between local and regional authorities. We know, for instance, that surveys are a really good method for understanding victimization, but they're very expensive and they're complicated to set up and they're less uh, relevant to understand citizens' feelings of insecurity. So we also need to complete them with more qualitative methodologies, more agile and qualitative. So we really want to continue at FUs to, co to continue capitalizing on the tools that were developed by CCI partners and to continue exploring qualitative methods and tools that our cities can use to better identify and tackle feelings of insecurity, to be better be in touch with what preoccupies citizens that might not appear in official statistics, of course. Uh, so this exploration, this capitalization will, will take place through our trainings that FUs and the national forums uh, organize, will take place through cooperation projects, will take place through probably other types of conferences and seminars like the one we're that is taking place today, and will also take place through interventions. I mentioned how um, we have these different cooperation projects that where we can use these tools. And one of the projects that I wanted to just touch upon was the project Icarus. So the project Icarus is a very large scale, it's an H2020 uh, European uh, funded project that really bases itself on the premise that local stakeholders um, need to cooperate with citizens in producing knowledge and therefore actions to produce the most efficient outcomes. It's been in the working for a long time. It's the result of many different projects and conversations and research pieces coming together. Uh, some of the, one of these projects, of course, being CCI. And the Icarus project is not only about petty crime, it also focuses, it has one focus on petty crime, but also trafficking, organized crime and radicalization. Um, the idea is to respond to, to challenges that are met by all of, this, uh, all of our cities. First of all, the decline in confidence and trust uh, of the public um, of citizens in public inst institutions. So we know we need to reinforce locally based actors to foster citizen participation, to increase the buy-in that citizens will have in public policy. Second question or second issue that our, 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 all of our cities are facing are obviously drastic budget cuts uh, in public service in general, in local authorities in particular, and the need to be more agile and more efficient with the, the, the funds that we uh, that we you, we have. Uh, the third sort of characteristic that led us to uh, mobilize uh, our forces around the Icarus project is the transient character of violence and crime and the interconnectedness of cities that uh, means that they're sharing their issues, they're sharing their problems, the trafficking of people or trafficking of drugs and and uh, and and different uh, violent behaviors are facilitated by the mobility. So we also need to pool our resources and, and share our knowledge in order to be more efficient in responding to this transient nature. And our main focus uh, in Icarus, I think the guiding principle, and I think that the, the uh, characteristic that I would like to really emphasize today, and is, which is in link, which is enabled by uh, 
a lot of the work that we've done together in CCI is the idea of providing strategic foresight to cities, is the idea that cities need to reinforce their methodologies as well to include uh, anticipation to, to, to enable their uh, local directors of public safety, their crime prevention officers, of course, their local elected officials to better understanding the current, but also the upcoming security challenge to better be ready to respond to emerging uh, trends. So we have to look at social and technological innovations on a permanent level and to adapt our methodologies in order to include those innovations to help of course, bridge the gap between the academic knowledge that we have and the urban security practices. We, we still see a, a, a broad gap that we need to, to bridge on a daily le level. And we need to uh, improve also the dialogue and the, the, the processes of dialogue between groups which don't necessarily communicate very well within a local authority and which are necessary to work together. So the foresight, the culture of foresight and the culture of anticipation is something that we haven't achieved yet at all, I think, in our uh, crime prevention or violence prevention community, but that we're striving towards. And I think the, um, the tools that were developed, uh, many of the tools that were developed uh, in those three years of work can really be used and tried and tested throughout Europe and hopefully uh, in different contexts also to see how they can help us in this culture of anticipation and foresight. Beyond projects like CCI and Icarus, we're also, the, the FUS is also keen on participating in dialogues with European institutions and bringing the voices of local and regional authorities to the attention of commissioners of the European Parliament, of the Council of Europe, of the different agencies with, at, at an international, at a European, and at national levels. So we've also been coordinating the Partnership on Security in Public Spaces, which is a, a, a consultation mechanism that was set up by the European Union within the Urban Agenda for the EU uh, to better hear and to better exchange between Commission and, um, and local actors. So we've worked with um, a very broad range of cities, and we've worked with the City of Madrid and City of Nice in coordinating this agenda and hopefully um, developing some tools that can be useful also to, to your partnership, to all of our future actions. We've worked on measuring the impact of social cohesion on security, for instance, which I think is, is a key area of, um, uh, of, of work for EFUS and for the Urban Agenda. We've also worked on revising some of the guidance for architectural spatial design beyond, uh, beyond the, the semantic uh, discussions of whether it's SEPTED or security by design, how we better design public spaces to take into account violence, fear of crime, and feeling of security uh, on a more positive note. We've also worked on the evaluation of AI and how artificial intelligent technologies need to be uh, set up and monitored in order to be fully efficient and compliant with uh, ethical standards. And so the, we've also used, and this is a, another link I wanted to point out with CCI, uh, a lot of the tools that were produced by the CCI project, especially in the areas of predictive policing, and crime prevention through environmental design. So these were very useful and uh, to the urban agenda and will be carried forward in that partnership. I also wanted to just very briefly say a word about the extended security model that Caroline and Andrew are presenting today. And I think it strongly aligns with FU's work and with our philosophy in many ways. First of all, of course, because it's human or citizen centered. And I think that's a, 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 a key um, sort of philosophical approach or positioning that we want to uh, share and support is being focused on citizens and not focused on each institution that's delivering a part of security. It also supports uh, our focus on prevention, of course, our focus on collaboration, our uh, desire to share what works and sometimes what doesn't work, but to share practice between cities. So in conclusion, 
Thank you for sharing uh, your time with me today. Thank you for including us in your work. The CCI project is coming to a close next month, but of course we'll continue working not only with the partners, but also using the, all those results and outputs, as I mentioned, nourishing projects, supporting local and regional authorities, but also promoting an inclusive, a sustainable, and a rights-based approach around citizens of security at a European level. Thank you so much for your attention. So thank you very much to Elizabeth. And uh, it is a shame that she couldn't be with us today um, in person, but um, as she says, we are continuing very closely to work with EFAS and um, EFAS have been obviously involved very strongly in this event and uh, throughout CCI. So it's just left to me then to give a few closing remarks. Um, I'd like to start by thanking my project officer for his support throughout CCI. His name is Marcus Walter, and he has supported me personally and he has supported the whole consortium, and I'm very grateful to him. I'd also like to thank the CCI project consortium partners and the advisory board members. Andrew and I have really enjoyed coordinating this project and working with you all. This conference would not have been possible without our great organizing team, comprising the Deutsche Präventionstag, EFAS and LOBA. I am so grateful for their positive attitude and their practical support in the face of, as you can imagine, multiple challenges, not least from COVID. Looking back on the past 36 months of CCI, it has been a long and sometimes challenging journey. Thanks again to COVID. We started back in 2018 with research to understand the needs and requirements of our six LEA partners. We explored these findings, developing multiple concept ideas and directions. And then after extensive prototyping, eight CCI tools were successfully produced. I'm so proud of what CCI has produced as I hope you've had a chance to see, each tool is bespoke to the LEA that developed it. It's in their language, uses their branding, it addresses a specific problem of concern and functions in a way that fits their particular operational context. Using the CCI human-centered design approach, each tool was developed by the LEA for the LEA. Tools have been developed with the support of LOBA and in particular with Caterina as design manager and her team back in Portugal, that they have managed to produce tools that are finished, well-designed products. And the tools have been demonstrated with their end users in their operational context and I'm pleased to say that some have already been implemented. I think that CCI shows that effective tools and solutions addressing practical security issues can be developed and implemented with the right approach. We firmly believe that human-centered approach adopted by CCI is fundamental to its, approach, to its success. But we must remember, as Andrew outlined yesterday, Design success requires a mindset, a particular attitude, a way of thinking and working. CCI's success is down to our great consortium members and how well we all work together. I mean, let's face it, CCI asked a lot from our LEA partners. They received a crash course in human-centered design research and innovation and had to follow a product design process to successfully develop their tools. This meant that LEAs had to undertake design research to look objectively at working practices in their organization, to ask difficult questions, identify problems, and confront any organizational shortcomings that were re 
revealed. Such critical reflection is not easy and it may in fact be discouraged. And I think you will be impressed when we've discussed approaches like predictive policing, how open the LEAs have been to identifying what the issues are and doing something about it. In terms of skills, we're talking about the ability to research and think divergently, as well as the capability to develop, launch, and promote a finished product. A product that will be acceptable and taken up because it meets end users' needs and is well designed. I hope that CCI partners have helped through CCI project to develop their skills and that they find their abilities useful in addressing problems in the future. I know that we've certainly learned a lot from working with you all in such a hands-on manner. Andrew and I are very grateful to the stamina and dedication of our research fellow, Dr. Dagmar Heinrich, in supporting the LEAs in this challenge and for supporting us too, of course. We're just putting the finishing touches to a series of bespoke web portals for each of the CCI tools. These will be shared with you in the next couple of weeks and will provide a platform from where you can download the tools, find out more about them, share them with colleagues, and discover more about their implementation. Finally, we would really value your feedback on this conference. To do this, please simply scan the QR code on the back of the conference program. If you scan that with your phone, you'll be taken to a very short and easy to use online survey. We'd be very grateful for your help with this. So I will now finally close the Designing Security Futures conference. But before you leave, I do urge you all to take a few minutes to visit the various stands of the other EU projects exhibiting here today. Have a look at some of the excellent research being done before you go. I'd also urge you um, to go to the Orangerie in the other room and perhaps to have a nice glass of wine and to network um, with the members of the consortium and with all the participants that are here today. And I've got one request which is of our uh, consortium is that Katerina asked whether we might come on stage um, so that she can just take a picture so that we can remember this final conference. It may be the last time that we're all together face to face for some time and we really want to enjoy it. So thank you very much.